Councillors. If the mic would work. Um, the, will I go on to item 7 and the Deputy Provost will now take items 7 and 8. Good afternoon, councillors, and I will invite Jim Valentine, the Deputy Chief Executive, to introduce this report. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillors, you will recall that in November 2017, the Council approved the proposed Local Development Plan 2, which then became the settled view of the Council. That plan was published and the representation period ran from December 2017 until February 2018. 742 representations were received and over 2,000 comments were submitted in this period. These numbers were partly attributable to the extensive public engagement process embarked upon by Oxford. The unresolved representations were submitted to the Scottish Ministers with a, uh, with a request that an examination be undertaken. This took place between November last year and July this year, and the findings of the examination now form the subject of the report before you. Before commenting further on the detail of these findings, it is worth reflecting that the purpose of this local development plan has been to identify new areas of land and those policies which for a variety of reasons <coughs> require to be amended or introduced for the first time. Those aspects of the 2014 plan which had not yet been implemented but remained appropriate in terms of their land use zoning and those policies which do not require amendment have simply carried forward. This has meant that the emerging LDP2 has not been as controversial as LDP1. Nonetheless, the significance of today's report and emerging LDB2 should not be underplayed. This is a document which the Council is required to produce to fulfil its obligations in terms of Hay Plan 2016 to 2036 and Scottish planning policy. It will provide for the immediate five year period to 2024 and on a more provisional basis a direct future development up to 2029. It sets out our planning aspirations for future generations, providing for further residential and employment land, which will deliver much needed houses and employment opportunities. It also provides for major infrastructure investments, such as across the Link Road, and does this in a sustainable manner, despite the environmental constraints of this authority's area, such as the special areas of conservation, for example, the River Tay and Loch Leader. It has taken a great deal of officer time and council resources over the last five years to reach this point. Turning to the findings themselves, the diverse issues raised in the unresolved representations were dealt with as 50 topics. It is pleased to report that the reporters have in the main supported the council's position. Firstly, in terms of the amount of housing land and the general strategy, but also in the substantial majority of the individual issues examined. It has to be accepted that in a small number of issues, the reporter has not supported the Council's position. However, officers have considered these cases in terms of the regulations and concluded that there is no scope for the Council to do other than accept these findings. An exercise of this scale is always a team effort. It follows that you will have detailed queries which I cannot answer, but Peter Marshall and members of his team are present and we'll be pleased to answer any questions members may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on this report? Councillor Ellingworth. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Given the experience of residents in the Bridge Event area following closure of the GP surgery there, I would ask the Leader of the Council to send a copy of the Local Development Plan to NHS Tayside and invite them to engage more proactively with local communities so they can address concerns and seek means of meeting local needs in a creative manner. Thank you, Councillor Illingworth. I think that was probably more a comment than a question, but um, I, I will forgive you. I will be very kind because I, I really do appreciate what you were trying to do there. And I hope the leader of the council does accept that. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Bailey.
we're looking at um, page 361 of the overall document bundle, um, paragraph three point, sorry, 2.34 down the bottom there, talking about the Perth West development site. Um, it's describing there how the reporter has accepted or we're accepting a, um, a, a pause and review after a certain number of houses or a certain <coughs> year. Um, that, that's good to see, but um, at what point do we expect to see the first house being built in that Perth West site, given that the existing um, Bertha Park, um, perhaps the build rate hasn't been at what we've been quite expecting? When do we expect the first house to be built on um, at Perth West? Thank you. I Peter Marshall going to ask? Brenda Murray will answer that question. Thank you. Um, I think at this stage, um, I can't really put a time scale on when we would expect to, to see the first house. Um, I do know that a lot of work has been done in relation to the Perth First site um, and getting it to this stage. Um, and I would expect that the developers would want to move forward um, as quickly as feasibly possible. So the length of time to prepare, submit a planning application. So perhaps within the next 12 to 18 months. Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, my uh, question is uh, concerning um, uh, 231 and 232, and I have a page number here, um, but there's a paragraph. It concerns um, uh, Perth West MU70 um, development, um, where could someone explain um, that it was first mooted that the, that the object, objection of the allocation, uh, no, that, that the plan for this was more a long-term plan um, that uh, would be brought forward at a later stage. However, this has not happened. Um, we now have a situation where it's uh, uh, coming forward a lot sooner than we uh, planned. And uh, the terminology planning blight has been used in these two paragraphs. And uh, could someone explain exactly what the this two paragraphs is uh, pertaining to. I think Brenda's going to answer that one again. You around the corner. In terms of the site, the site is a long-term allocation, as are a number of the strategic development sites on the, the western side of Perth. Um, in terms of it when it was at would actually start, it's never been said that that would be um, at some period in the future. And some of the objections that were coming forward to it um, were perhaps suggesting that, but the, the council um, itself have never said, you know, that there will be a, you know, a time below before that starts. It's just been a site that is there for the long term and will take a period of time to, to build through. But, but wouldn't you agree that it seems to be coming forward at a swifter pace than you anticipated? I wouldn't necessarily say so, no. This was a site which, um, as you know from the history, um, was brought forward at the LDP1 um, time, so you know, way back um, 10 years ago. Um, the landowners, developers have been doing a lot of work around that site. Um, so I would expect them to be in a, a good place to, to bring it forward, um, having had that time to look at and consider. I think Jim Valentine would like to add something to the answer here. Thank you. Yeah, it was just for you to remind Council that there's also been a successful basic review and bid in respect of the land to the south of MU70. So there is a live development being worked up at this moment in time. going to be a long queue there, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, uh, firstly, can I thank the officers for the assistance that they've provided uh, in terms of the briefing and in answering questions uh, with regard to the LDP2. Um, I have to say, like uh, Councillor Anderson, I am perplexed uh, by the reporter's uh, findings and apparent obsession with uh, planning blight. 
Uh, but my concern is in uh, relation to uh, uh, the Murray Royal site, uh, MU336, uh, and in the appendix with regard to MU336, the reporter has introduced the subject again of planning blight and concerns expressed in this regard. Um, and can officers advise what volume of developer and resident submissions were submitted to the reporter for him to consider examination in coming to the conclusion that the previous restriction that only the listed buildings should be developed ahead of the completion of the Cross T Link Road uh, be removed? Thank you. I think it's Peter Marshall is going to answer that question. Thank you. In terms of the number, uh, I'm looking here at the submission to the uh, Scottish Ministers in the Schedule 4, and I'm going to ask Brenda to count them up, but I'm guessing here there's more than 20. Um, only one of them specifically made reference to planning blight uh, in the representation. However, um, it's for a reporter to consider all of the representations and it is the merits of the representations, not the number of representations which he should take account of. And the issue of planning blight is, it's generally a term which is referred to as where there are some form of restrictions being imposed through the planning system that will prevent development. In this case, the situation is, if you don't have an economically viable development, then it will not take place. And if the restrictions on the planning consent are uh, preventing it becoming an economically viable development, then it is termed as planning blight. That doesn't mean to say it's not justifiable planning blight, but it would be considered planning blight. And it is quite clear with most major listed buildings that the economic viability in the current market conditions of conversion is at best very marginal, um, at worst is just does not make economic sense without what we call enabling development. And I can quote a classic example we've seen recently in Perth, and that was of the Caledonian Road School, where to make it viable, we had the additional new build blocks beside that site, without which uh, we would have not been able to see that site deliver for affordable housing. And I should also emphasize the private sector just wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, if you excuse the expression, because of its viability. And even Caledonian Road School only became viable with additional public subsidy over and above that. So we have a situation with Murray Royal that it is fairly clear that it will require additional development to make it a viable project. And without the guarantee of additional development, a developer or his lenders are uh, unlikely to allow that development to proceed. I don't know if we have an answer yet on that. 29 total representations. If, if I could have a follow-up on that, 29 total representations <coughs> seems a, a reasonable figure for um, a, a site of that sort of Im Im importance. However, um, one ma mention of, of, of planning blight seems to uh, uh, give disproportionate, um, or the examiner seems to have given disproportionate attention to, to, to that. Um, so I think my question is, uh, in the officer's um, professional opinion, and notwithstanding what um, the Deputy Chief Executive said in, in, his, in his reduction, uh, introduction, I should say, um, are, are officers of, of, of the view that the um, threshold set out in the regulations under item 2.5D um, are, 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 are not met in terms of departing from uh, the, the examiner's recommendation. And if that's the case, can you also tell me what safeguards uh, are there within the LDP uh, to um, uh, protect residents against the concerns that they have and also the council's concerns that have been raised at the live um, planning appeal uh, with regard to that site and to do with traffic congestion uh, and air quality? Uh, yes, it's certainly our opinion that there isn't a justification for departing for the reporter's recommendation. But could I perhaps also uh, make the comment that the reporter is not saying that a development can go ahead uh, on the new build land. He is saying that it should, be, it should take account of a traffic assessment before making any decisions on the phasing. And as you'll be perfectly aware, there's been recent uh, planning appeal which we don't have the results of yet, 
which the main debate was on the traffic assessments and the disagreement between the council on the traffic assessment and the developer. Okay, Councillor McDade. Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, you will have to excuse my, I uh, nearly lost my voice at this point, so you will be delighted. <laughs> it's going to be short. Uh, I've got two questions, if that's okay. Um, I'd quite like to understand uh, uh, paragraph 2.45. Um, it talks about the Highland area um, and the difficulty in identifying effective sites due to topography. Um, and uh, it talks about diverting some of the uh, demand to the Perth housing park area. Um, I'd quite like to understand the rationale behind the reallocating demand to Perth rather than other rural areas in Perth and Kinross. Um, I'd also quite like to understand um, why perhaps the decision wasn't taken around putting smaller sites in some of the communities that still have opportunity for growth. Um, there are some places where there isn't any proposals, and I understand that TAFE land does have a you know, priority uh, ratio, but we do seem to have effectively an over-provision in Perth and an under-provision in some of the rural areas. And I know from speaking to some of the smaller builders, they do struggle to actually find sites to build in rural areas because there's no small sites zoned that are of the appropriate size for them. They often want 10s or 12s and not you know, 70. So that's the first question. Peter, can you please answer that? Thank you. And in terms of the, the first part of your question, um, <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice too, um, why we didn't allocate it to other uh, areas such as uh, Strathmore in the Glens or, or Strathmore uh, was that most of the connections are uh, towards Perth. Uh, also, the Perth market area is about 50% of the entire um, council housing allocations, and there is much more scope to uh, absorb the relatively small numbers being diverted from Highland area into the, the Perth area. Um, the second part of your question relating to the identification of small sites, the plan does allow for small sites to come forward through the houses in the countryside policy and small sites within the settlement. Um, we generally don't identify sites of uh, uh, 10 or less, rather referring to them as white land, which is land within the settlement boundaries. And within the Highland area, it varies from year to year, but we've seen as high as 50% or just over 50% of the completions being on these small unallocated sites. It's the nature of the market in the Highland area. So there is still significant scope for that. And in trying to persuade the reporter how we were meeting the housing demand, although we have accepted there is a higher proportion of uh, small sites coming forward in Highland which will serve towards the um, housing needs. Um, the percentage which we did um, uh, allocate to that sector of the market was still less than we would expect to see because we had to be sure that we could guarantee the proportion coming forward from the small sites would uh, uh, be realistic. Um, I should also point out though that uh, unlike some parts of the plan area where we were seeing proposals come forward for housing sites and we weren't allocating in the plan or weren't recommending the, their allocation in the plan, there were very few proposals in Highland area which came forward which were realistic, um, which um, could be considered. And the point you make about small builders is, is perfectly valid. They find real difficulty to uh, find sites, but it's not primarily because of the planning system, it's topography, it's flooding, the availability of services for these sites, which again, uh, in some cases, makes them uh, uneconomic. So it, it is a completely different dynamic from most of our other um, housing areas. Councillor Gray, oh sorry. Thank you. Um, my second question is in part linked to the first one, which is around um, the additional provision, uh, shall we say, in the Perth area around the, the, the west site in Bertha Park. And do we think that given the council spent a significant amount of money putting infrastructure into enable some of these developments, and given the 
very available supply that that will actually bring house prices down around the north side of the park. Not sure if it's I, I think it's difficult to say that uh, house prices will be affected by uh, the investment in the infrastructure because, let us face it, developers will get from a um, site the highest value they think they can achieve. Um, the question is whether housing would help, uh, would happen or not if there wasn't investment in infrastructure as, as perhaps the, the permanent one. The, the pertinent one rather than how it would affect the house prices. And if developments are not coming forward generally across the area to meet demand, it will force house prices up um, rather than bring, bring them down. I'm not sure if that helped. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate it. I think mine it was more of a, an economics question in some respect about supply and demand but it would be quite interesting at a future point to find out what council is doing to enable developments in rural areas as well as the ones around the north of town. Councillor Gray. Deputy Provost, um, this is a time where uh, there's much increasing uh, consultation with the public and community on most of the work that we do in the council. And uh, regarding planning, this is very much the case. Uh, take paragraph 253. Uh, Crook of Devon, MU 266. Contrary to Council's position, the reporter has recommended removal of this mixed-use site. There has been some objections to the proposal following consultation and conditional support from two respondents. Then look at 257, this is Comrie, H58. There was one of the sites which, this was one of the sites which raised the highest number of objections. However, the reporter uh, agrees that no modification is necessary. Do officers agree that these decisions suggest inconsistency on the part of the reporter and demonstrate scant regard of local opinion on these sites? And uh, can you suggest any way in which public opinion might be reinforced for the future? Um, with regard to um, the first one, which was um, the Crook of Devon site, um, I would say that the reporter can only look at the evidence which is in front of him at the time. Now, one of the big challenges is in the planning system is to get the people who support development to actually say it. The people who agree with the council's position and the, the site generally tend not to write in and say, good idea, we support it. But those that object will make the effort to put in an objection. And I think if you look at what was in front of the reporter, um, there was uh, the objections, but what appeared to be relatively little support. And I might also say that in this case, uh, the community council sat on the fence with regard to, to this issue. So it perhaps left the reporter with a, a little bit of a ambiguity about what the, the true position was. With regard to... Um, the Comrie site, although there's a high number of objections, as, as I said in an answer to an earlier question, it's not the quantity of objections, it's the quality of the objections and the points that they are making. And I think the reporter felt that in the case of Comrie, that the points weren't perhaps as valid, but in Crook of Devon, perhaps the reporter thought that uh, there was merit in the, the reasons against this site. So it's difficult to motivate the public uh, to give a, a, a full view of, of their uh, um, opinions, particularly when they're not opposed to the council's position. Thank you. I take it there are no more questions? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Dugan. Yeah, thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Um, it's uh, on the um, HU, uh, sorry, MU70 site and discussions uh, about that between uh, officers and the reporter. Can I ask if the adjacent um, employment uh, use E340 has had a bearing on any of these decisions? And if it hasn't, what are officers' um, intentions for that uh, area 
given the length of time it's been um, unrealised as a development opportunity and its relationship to housing land adjacent, which has been uh, very quickly developed. Thank you very much for the question. Mr Marshall, going to... Sorry, I should, um, pro uh, Deputy Provost, I should have said the page if officers don't have it. It's, uh, it's uh, 2.3.4, the schematic just above. Um, although they're the same landowner, um, they are two separate proposals. In Perth West, there's a conglomeration of, of landowners. Um, we're continuing to discuss with the landowners in terms of E40 how that is going to be brought forward. Uh, but I would say it's a separate issue in, the, in this instance in terms of the LDP and the new proposals brought back, brought forward for uh, Perth West. Councillor Dugan, are you quite happy with that answer? Yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you. Is there no one else has indicated that they wish to ask any question? Is that correct? I'd like to thank the officers for answering the questions, and I will now invite Councillor Lyle to move. It's a challenge, but anyway. The report presented, us, presented to us today represents one of the final stages necessary to secure the second Perton Kinross local development plan. It is the product of extensive work undertaken by our officers, and that work has, throughout, involved a significant public consultation. It has also required considerable time and effort on the part of a number of elected members, communities, and interest groups and also the development industry. Over 50 issues were examined by a team of reporters appointed on behalf of the Scottish Government. They delivered their findings to us at the beginning of July. In the substantial majority of cases, these reporters have found that there should be no change to the terms proposed in the plan or have otherwise agreed with the Council's recommendations to the examination. We should remain focused on these successes that said, it is almost inevitable that we would not prevail in respect of all four, four, 742 representations and in excess of 2,000 comments which were considered by the reporters. It is never good to lose an argument, but the reality is the reporters' findings are binding upon us. Therefore, I ask members to accept the reality of this situation and to concentrate on the benefits which will follow from our publication of an up-to-date adopted development plan. This will direct developers to the correct sites. It also contains a comprehensive and up-to-date policy framework. I appreciate that members and communities may have some concerns about the impact of further residential sites coming forward during the plan period, and <coughs> particularly in relation to the impacts on infrastructure, including the road network, schools, drainage, water supply, and health facilities. With regard to this, I have three points to make. Firstly, we are obliged to deliver a plan which meets the land supply targets imposed, on, upon, imposed upon us. Secondly, our officers liaised with all partner agencies in the lead up to the proposed plan in November 2017 and have continued to do so in relation to the proposals outlined in the report today. <coughs> Thirdly, and importantly, I would remind members that after the plan is adopted, we are obliged to prepare an action plan. Oh, pardon me, to secure delivery of the plan. The action plan requires to be kept up to date and its progress will be subject to further reports to this council. This includes a duty to liaise with other key agencies, one of which repeat, one of which is NHS Tayside. And at this point, I take on board Councillor Illingworth's comments earlier. I am assured by our Chief Operating Officer that strenuous efforts will be made to ensure the close cooperation with all partnership agency colleagues 
and to secure the successful and sustainable delivery of this plan. On this basis, I am happy to move the report. Thank you. Any comments on the report? Councillor Barnacle. Uh, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, just prior to the briefing session I attended on the 8th of August, I had queried why we were having them when it's clear from paragraphs 25 to 27 that we are directed to accept the examination report. <coughs> However flawed we may feel the conclusions. I personally find it astonishing that one cannot challenge the unelected reporters unit regarding what one may regard as a flawed assessment based on incomplete evidence and the only recourse is back to PKC for blind acceptance. This is a clear democratic deficit in the current planning system sanctioned by the government and it should be challenged at MSP level. I'm advised by legal services that moving amendments may not be competent, so I'm not going to. But I do take real issue with the key findings and modifications in the report on three matters, noting that all has been decided on the basis of written submissions alone, unac unaccompanied site inspections, and no inquiry or public hearing. Firstly, policy 1D on placemaking. The member officer working group that looked at LDP2 issues decided that a capacity range for house zonings was more appropriate than LDP1 approach, which simply stated a site number. Since there have been a number of planning recommendations approving site applications in excess of LDP1 figures in recent times, I was content that the capacity range approach was more flexible, but also gave communities some certainty as to the upper parameters of development. I regard the upper figures of the range as something that would have addressed this, but the reporter regards it as inappropriate and has taken the representatives from the development sector are they want indicative only. I believe this is a worse position than before and a development charter and I am totally opposed to it. That's number one. Number two, I find no reference to my prime agricultural land. This policy is not strong enough and there has been a significant failure to protect such finite land for food production from development, both in this council and elsewhere, contrary to national planning policy. When we have an increasing population, this is short-sighted. Hopefully, the National Planning Framework 4 on rural issues will address this. And finally, the third item, the removal of the site in Crooked Evan, referred to by Councillor Gray. The reporter's assessment acknowledges the existence of services in Crook of Devon, but maintains there is significant local opposition to the allocation of the site and its historical context. My evidence file would really dispute this assessment, and I would question why four local members who supported its inclusion would have done so if there was such opposition. The separation between Drum and Crook of Devon referred to no longer exists, having been compromised by this council when they sanctioned the Crook Moss Gypsy Traveller site in October 13, approved against the overwhelming opposition of the community <coughs> and local members. At no time was there any reference to PKC's landscape consultant's assessment of the area. 
this consultant it's assessment. Sorry, Nicola, you're nearly to the end because I think you've been probably more than yeah, five okay, minutes. I'll, I'll so I'm being very lenient in my uh, first meeting. Okay. Meeting. This consultant assessment covered both sites, so there's been a different interpretation. They've also ignored um, the contribution that could be made to A977 mitigation measures and preferred development in Blair and Gone. There are no services. I think it's an illogical position. So I could go on how I'm in dispute with the reporter. Um, the one final thing, we had agreed a 50% affordable housing contribution. And just to tell you, in PKC's strategic housing investment plan to 2024, there is no provision for any affordable housing in the rural villages of Kinrosshire. I was going to mention landscape, and I won't. In summary, I would like my dissent recorded on adopting LDP2 in relation to these three matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Barnacle, for your comments. And can I remind other councillors that five minutes is really the maximum this afternoon, or we might be here for quite considerable time. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I just really wanted to uh, uh, add my thanks to uh, Councillor Lyle, um, to staff and officers for the um, amount of work that they've put in to bring forward this plan. Um, the public consultations were robust. The willingness to take on board developers and elected members' suggestions was very evident and gratefully received. I think it's now time for us to take on board the reporter's findings. I know that there are many of us in this chamber that disagree with some of the uh, results, but we are where we are. And it is now time to focus on progressing the ongoing development forward for the benefit of Perth and Kim Ross. Thank you very much. Councillor Purvis. Um, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I'd just like to add some uh, similar comments to those made by um, Councillor Barnacle. Um, I too am very unhappy with um, some of the findings of the reporter's um, examination um, and uh, if um, it were within this council's gift um, would have liked to see some of those uh, recommendations um, amended but given the advice that we've had by officers and that obviously um, this is now a different situation from the previous local plans um, we are obliged to accept those so I would also ask that rather than bring an amendment um, understanding order 60 my dissent be recorded in terms of this decision. Um, just in terms of some of the specific matters, I would also like to echo some of the comments that have been made about the placemaking policy um, and the change by the reporter. I think that the recommendation that the member officer and working group made of having a housing density range was a very positive one and would have given greater certainty to our communities who are concerned about the, the level of development. I do believe that most um, of our constituents aren't anti-development but want to have some certainty about the uh, necessary infrastructure provisions um, and other provisions that need to be in place to ensure that that uh, development happens in a sustainable fashion. So by um, including um, a maximum, um, an absolute maximum at the top of these density ranges, that would have ensured that greater certainty for our constituents. Um, and I'm disappointed that the, the Schedule 4 that this council passed by what was a, a, a super majority um, has been rejected by um, the reporter and not only rejected by the reporter but the reporter now says that the entire um, density range will be indicative. Now most of the lower bounds of these density ranges are higher than the previous indicative number so as Councillor Barnacle said I, I now believe this to be a, an inferior position to what we had in the first place um, so that is very um, disappointing and it is um, a, a great irritation to me that an unelected and unaccountable Scottish Government reporter um, can impose um, such things on the council and, uh, and threaten to impose them if the council were not to um, adopt um, their recommendations. I also agree with Councillor Barnacle's comments in relation to landscape designations, which he hasn't said but has uh, circulated in a letter, um, and also um, in terms of the, uh, the site at Crook of Devon. I think this would have been a really positive development given the 50% uh, affordable housing allocation and particularly having more affordable housing in rural areas in Kinrosha. I think um, there is the possibility in future of looking through a development trust or some other options where we can try and progress that support um, that uh, development with the support of the community. So I wouldn't um, think that it's, it's never going to happen, um, but unfortunately it won't be in this plan. Um, and just finally, on a slightly more positive note, um, I am pleased that the uh, reporter has agreed to include uh, my um, Schedule 4 amendment um, for the route action plans for the A977 and the B9097 to include um, the uh, references to those route action plans in the settlement summaries for Ballard, Blair and Gone. 
Cow Mill um, and Rumbling Bridge um, and uh, Crook of Devon. Um, so that's thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. It comes as no surprise that I'm also um, happy to endorse the comments of Councillor Purvis and Councillor Barnacle. Um, I'm old enough to remember when we had local plans coming to committee to be formally adopted that councillors could actually make adjustments to it to meet um, local changes that we wanted to see. And I think that was, that was good. That was democracy in action. Now, I think it was, we should... This paper shouldn't really even come to us now because we can do nothing with it. This, we are told what to accept and that's it. Don't, don't interfere. The report has made his decision. We can't do anything about it. You're, we are accountable for what we do, but we can't actually do anything to adjust the, the findings of the reporter. That is a, a, actually a nonsense. Um, with regard to the density ranges for, for housing sites, um, I actually think that's really bad planning. If you've got housing sites, if you know within your communities the number of sites you've got, the average number of houses that's liable to provide, and that's then exceeded by the developer by what, 30, 40, 50 percent, it throws the whole planning guidelines that you're working to out of kilter. And it really, really upsets the people you're there to represent. So all in all, I think this is a very sad day. And this is not progress. This is not progress, a, a government reporter telling us what to do. This is not progress. It's a bad step backwards. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. <coughs> uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I was going to um, address the issue of uh, Policy 1D placemaking in the um, the site capacity ranges um, in the context of the motion that um, I and Councillor Barnacle had brought be, uh, before elected members last year. Um, <coughs> but I think actually um, Councillor Barnacle, Councillor Purvis and, and Councillor Robertson have, have said most of what needs to be said. Um, the This council occasionally decides things by um, uh, unanimous agreement. Um, it occasionally decides things on um, the, a casting vote. Um, but of all the votes that we have actually had, everything that we've been pushed to a vote, um, the 33 votes to five majority in favour of um, the capacity ranges, the reasons behind that um, were that that's the largest vote that we've had. And, and for that to be ignored by the Scottish Government reporter, um, is, 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 as Councillor Robertson and, and, and Councillor Purvis and, uh, and Barnacle indicate, just um, a completely undemocratic move. Um, Councillor Purvis suggested that this, the site capacity ranges were there to improve certainty for our communities. In moving the motion last year, um, I indicated that it wasn't just for the people in our communities. It was also to provide certainty for our developers and to provide certainty for um, our hardworking planning officers and to provide certainty for elected members when they were coming to make decisions on planning applications. Planning applications which, as Councillor Robertson uh, indicates in the past, um, have occasionally seen um, uh, indicative numbers in, in from the previous local development plan exceeded not, I, I would suggest, without wishing to correct, Councillor Robertson, not just by 30, 40 or 50 percent, but occasionally by 100, 120, 150 percent. This, uh, the intention of this, um, uh, uh, th the motion that we put to council um, and that was passed by such a, a, a large majority was to provide certainty to all participants in the planning process and I regret greatly the fact that it's been overturned um, by an unelected and unaccountable reporter in the Scottish Government and I would also like to uh, record my dissent from uh, approval of the, this portion of the plan. Thank you very much, Councillor Stewart. Are there any other comments on this report? No? I take it from the fact that we have a few that wish to dissent, this report is not going to be unanimous, but I, can we agree this? Oh, sorry, Councillor Jarvis, you wish to? I'd, I'd just like to ask a question. Yeah. Um, 
in view of the comments have been made, and I have to, have to say that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got stuck. <laughs> Uh, in view of the comments that have been made, I have to say, I personally am not terribly happy with this. Would it be uh, of interest to have a show of hands that we could maybe refer that back to the reporter that uh, there was a bit of dissatisfaction within this council of the dictatorship that it actually is? Thank you very much for these comments, Councillor Jarvis. I am looking at the leaders of the council and he is shaking his head, saying that is not possible. I will maybe take legal advice from Mrs. So, we're asked to approve the plan. We've That's it. Agreed. Thank you. Can I have my dissent recorded, please, Deputy Provost? Thank you. But, uh, Vice Deputy Provost, um, just to make sure the dissent that's been mentioned by certain members will be recorded. It, I think it is being recorded at this moment in time. Thank you very much. Compulsory purchase order. Can we please have some silence? Thank you. I will now invite the Deputy Provost Jim Valentine to introduce this report. Deputy Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Provost. Members, this report appears you before you today to seek council authority to acquire land either by negotiation or by compulsory purchase for the construction of phase two of the Perth Transport Futures Project, namely the Cross Sea Link Road. As members will be aware, the Perth Transport Futures Project forms an integrated series of measures designed to address major congestion and air quality issues in and around Perth, and to provide essential linkages to growth areas always set out in the soon to be adopted LDP2. Phase one of the Perth Transport Futures Project was successfully completed and delivered in May of this year. It is phase two, the CTLR, which is considered to be the key infrastructure project necessary to divert traffic away from the city centre, reducing <coughs> congestion and improving air quality, improve the local and regional transport network, support and encourage sustainable travel and unlock strategic development areas and sites. Delivery of the CTLR is therefore clearly of significant strategic importance to the Council. However, this report relates simply to the land required to facilitate its construction and seeks approval to acquire the necessary land by way of compulsory purchase. The project team have been in discussions with all affected landowners and tenants for some time now, with a view to reaching agreement on the necessary land take. However, as with any scheme of this size, and taking account of the number of affected landowners, it is proposed to promote a compulsory purchase order to acquire the land. This will ensure that all of the land will be, inquired, will be acquired within the required timescale and that there will be no gaps in title. The CPO would, however, be promoted in parallel with continuing negotiations with the affected parties. This is good practice and the same process as was undertaken for phase one. Following approval of the report today, the CPO will be made by the Council and submitted to the Scottish Ministers next month. The timescales after that will depend on whether any objections are received. However, the project team are hopeful that agreement can be reached in the majority of cases. The current programme allows for objections and anticipates a land vesting date of August 2021, enabling contract completion by spring 2024. The public exhibitions in, prepare, in preparation for the planning application took place last month. They were well attended and it is anticipated that the application will be lodged by the end of October. In conclusion, delivery of the CTLR is of strategic importance to the Council and essential to the provision of a more efficient and better connected transport system and to enhance the attractiveness of the area to inward investors. To enable the project timescales to be met and minimise costs, it is vital that the CPO process 
is commenced as soon as possible. I would therefore ask members to agree with the recommendations of the report by granting authority to acquire the necessary land, either by agreement or by compulsory purchase. Thank you very much, Jim. Are there any questions? Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, I'm looking at um, sections 216 to 218, the timetable uh, for uh, the proposed uh, CPO and uh, subsequent contract award and completion. It doesn't say so in the paper. Um, in the event that there are no unresolved objections, uh, there does not, and there therefore does not require to be a public inquiry. Uh, will the uh, contract award and completion in these circumstances be accelerated so that uh, it is possible, at least, that um, this vital project can be completed in 2023? Thank you, Councillor Drysdale. As regards the time scale, we have a, an, an element of uh, a cushion in it just now, so we think it may well be accelerated. But equally, if anything comes up once we actually start on site, uh, there, it can be a word away. But we would hope that there could be a degree of acceleration. Sorry, if I may just follow up, just, uh, just for clarity, therefore, if, if there does not require to be a public inquiry, uh, and as I understand it from 216, it could be, therefore, uh, a, a year sooner, um, it, you know, it could potentially be 2023. Yes, I'm quite happy. And yes, the land acquisition is actually on the critical path in the programme for the construction of the scheme, so therefore the completion. So any time that we would effectively make up, if you like, if there is no hearing or public inquiry, we are fairly confident we could pull that back in terms of the whole programme. Um, so we would look to start on site earlier. Mr Simpson. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Provost. Um, you'd be delighted to know that spare you the lecture on what a waste of money the cross to your link road is and, and ask a couple of detailed questions. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling with um, two of the areas being purchased, which are both fields separate from the cross to link road itself. Um, one is on Appendix 2C and is called 19T, and the other is in Appendix 2D and called 19AG. Uh, just for your interest, uh, 19AG at the moment has the largest pile of horse manure I've ever seen in my life in it, which may be appropriate in the context of the reasons the cross to your load rate. But, but anyway, I just wondered if we had an idea of why we're buying these two separate fields that are not beside the road at all. We thought we might ask that question. <laughs> um, the areas that you've highlighted are for compensatory planting. So they effectively, we have to basically replace what we take down. Um, the two areas that you mentioned, I think one is actually in the ownership of Richie as a landowner, the other one is Mansfield Estate. What we have done so far is we've put the plots in permanently to acquire, to plant. However, it's very likely, and this has been in discussion with the landowners, that those plots would change to temporary to allow us to go in and do the planting. Having, having got the answer, I might just ask perhaps a supplementary. Uh, particularly as regards that the, obviously the trees will grow well in, in, in 19 AG, given how fertile the soil, soil will now be. Um, it was my understanding that that area of ground had been earmarked um, for a football pitch. Um, unfortunately, oh, we keep the old school here. I, I, I understood in, in, in discussions with the local community uh, that particular field had been earmarked for a football pitch for Scone Thistle Football Club. I could, I could be wrong. Richard Marshall is going to answer this question. Sorry, we're just checking the plan. I, I think from the plan I'm looking at, it seems to me that the that area of land is 
uh, to the east of the bit that had been discussed for football pitches for Schoon Thistle. If we're looking at the same plan. Um, I'm looking at Appendix uh, 2D. It is a bit wee for me as well, I confess. It definitely adjoins HH29, which is coming on stream soon, apparently. To be helpful, I'm happy to get an answer later. It's not my intention to catch anybody out. I just wondered if we're having a football pitch or a forest, you know. Stuart wants, wants to ask us something. I don't know if it's a supplementary to Councillor Simpson. It is. Right, OK. Might help. Just, just being conscious of having, uh, uh, of knowing the, a little bit of what Councillor Simpson is talking about in terms of the, the, the football club in Schoon Thistle and, uh, and the proposed additional area for them to use um, but in in getting an answer to Councillor Simpson during the course of the meeting um, the officers will be aware that there are uh, the diagrams that were have been presented at the public consultation meetings on the cross tail link road in terms of um, what land is um, uh, intended intended within the planning applications and it might be helpful to overlay um, those plans with um, the appendices for the compulsory purchase orders. It's possible to get an answer to what Councillor Simpson is looking for at the moment, but are you quite happy that after, after the meeting? Does that satisfy? I'm content with that, as long as we get an answer at some point. Thank you, Deputy Provost. My question, there's two questions, but they're very tightly related, are around um, paragraph 2.12, the, in fact, the four paragraphs there about Transport Scotland um, liaisons. So the first part of the question is, um, do we have any, or how are we in any discussions with Transport Scotland about whether they will eventually adopt this road into their own ownership and maintenance once constructed? And then the second part of the question is, are we building the road to whatever applicable standard to ensure that the design or construction won't be a barrier to future adoption by um, Transport Scotland or a similar body in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. As regards the, uh, the road layout, the junctions at the line end will be adopted by Transport Scotland, as the other A9 junctions are. The rest will be a council road and be uh, constructed to appropriate council standards. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I'm looking at paragraph 2.14 on page 2002. And I, I, I don't quite understand the, the rationale for that paragraph. Obviously, if you cannot compulsorily purchase land owned by Scottish ministers, then it has to be done by agreement. Um, but is the real intent of this paragraph to suggest that there is land <coughs> owned by Scottish ministers on the route and that agreement's going to have to be reached? And is that a problem? Thank you. <coughs> yes, it's not possible to acquire Scottish ministers' land. So what we enter into, the, enter into with them is a minute of agreement. It's similar to what we did with the 985 scheme as well because they owned land there. Um, it's simply a procedural matter. We have actually got the draft minute of agreement and asset division plan. So they're currently both with Transport Scotland just for consideration and coming back. Um, they've also been through our legal teams as well. We don't envisage any problems. Councillor McDade. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, as to follow on from Councillor Simpson's earlier question, slightly different to his part of the question, but um, you may that the, the land is for compensatory planting, um, which I assume to be forestry. Um, if that's the case, you talked about that the possession, they might just take essentially temporary possession of the land to do compensatory planting, but then presumably it reverts back to the landowner at that point. So am I correct in thinking the landowner will then get the forestry payments for that?
In terms of any payments, um, those are considered amongst their compensation payment that the district valuer is assessing just now. That was going to be my other part of the question, which is, so presumably if they are getting the payment, we are not paying them as much for that, if at all. Is that correct, then? Just to add into that, that's not the case if it's part of a planning consent. Sorry, can you explain that a bit more for those of us in the cheap seats? Forestry grant payments are not eligible if it is a condition of a planning consent. So the developer in any housing site who has to put in a woodland belt is not eligible for forestry grant, grant payment. I, I can say we've confirmed the location if I can answer the, the question that came earlier. The area being discussed with Schoon Thistle for playing fields is some way to the west of the plot of ground being referred to. The plot of ground being referred to uh, in the earlier question is in an approximate location of the site reserved for a primary school within Schoon North, which would not uh, be expected to be developed until 20, uh, well, about 2030, well beyond the time scale for um, the Cross Tail Link Road. We've had a short already. It was just supplementary to that yes, answer. Okay. Um, I, I don't uh, uh, dispute what um, Mr. Martin is saying at all, but I would uh, uh, perhaps like a clarification with the map because what you are saying and the map do not do not add up. And it's an area I can see from my bedroom window, so I know it quite well. So I think I would like to see an overlay of the map. I think we can help by clarifying if we look at the maps together at the end of the meeting. Mm, over at Councillor McDade was, did you ask your question? Yeah, thank you. I think so, I'll not ask any more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. My question is actually, I had the same question that Councillor Simpson had, but I had identified three parcels of land rather than the two that he has. So the other parcel of land I'd identified was 19AF, which is right next to the A93, where the Cross Tail Link Road crosses, and I assume that there was a roundabout, etc. Similarly, yes, it's for planting. Um, at first, that area will actually be used as a temporary compound as well. My own hopes were that we could look at putting a park and light ride in there rather than just covering the trees, because I think that as a, a transport initiative going forward would be a much better use of that parcel of land. Um, thanks. Uh, so uh, my, given, given that my previous um, contribution was just a supplementary to, to Councillor Simpson's, I, I do have two questions, if that's all right, Deputy Provost. Um, the first is in, um, is the, in the discussions with Transport Scotland in 2.13, um, the legal agreement will also ensure that in the event that Transport Scotland decides to promote a trunk order under Section 5 of the Act, any parts of the scheme which are to be subject may be reconstructed. Which parts of the scheme are we thinking about that Transport Scotland might um, promote a trunk road order in relation to? Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Yes, anything at the A9 end, any of the junctions, the, the stop plus, etc., would all be covered by a council order. Okay, thank you for that clarif Thank you for that clarification. And my, my next question was just, it was just a follow up on the question or, or, or the explanation, and, and then the follow up question about the timetabling. Um, we are asked, uh, the recommendation will be to um, agree purchase of land in the report. Negotiate by negotiation with affected landowners, and if not, um, to make the CPO in October 2019. This is the um, third, fourth, last working day of September. I'm just, I, I just want to be absolutely clear that what we're talking about is negotiating with the landowners the purchase of the required land during the next couple of weeks, and if not, then promoting the CPO. Uh, just as explained earlier, there we have been um, speaking with the landowners and tenants for 
must be well over two years by now, actually. Um, so part of that is agreeing the design, the layout, um, like you're saying about the compensatory planting, accommodation works. So that has been all going on, on in the background for two years. Um, what stage we're at just now is that the plans are pretty much final, so the landowners all have these um, and have made their own comments on them. What we are now in the process of doing is drawing up agreements that will be in place during the consultation period for the compulsory purchase order. So we've met with all landowners and let them know that. So they're all in agreement to try and basically get the agreements in place such that it mitigates them having to object to anything in the CPO. So we do feel that we've been working as well doing the legal paperwork associated with the order. So my colleagues in legal have been doing that. Um, and all the land plot descriptions, these are all prepared. Just to clarify, but there wouldn't be any consultation period on the compulsory purchase orders if the land is acquired by negotiation. Um, and it's just, it was really to understand whether we were hopeful that we might acquire all of the land by negotiation, as in recommendation one, rather than having to um, actually go through the compulsory purchase order process um, and all of that during the next uh, four and a half weeks, five and a half weeks. If I can just uh, pick up on that point. Um, can you hear me? Right, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, the intention is to actually um, carry out both processes in parallel. Um, with a project of this size and the numerous landowners, um, in order to be certain that we can deliver the project within the required time scale, we need to have certainty and we can really only achieve that by following the compulsory purchase process alongside continued negotiations with the landowners. Um, once the compulsory purchase order has been made, um, it is still possible to withdraw land from, from the order if we can reach agreement on a voluntary basis. So we will be doing both the, the compulsory purchase process and continued negotiation side by side. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any? Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. It's just to get back to these uh, the tracks of uh, uh, the replacement tracks of forestry, the, the three uh, areas. Is this replacement of uh, production forestry? I'm pretty confident it's a combination of um, operational and um, permanent forestry that would be replanted through time obviously but again we can provide further details of that because there's details in the environmental impact assessment and the specimen design because okay. I'm sure um, the, the owners will be concerned if uh, it's said that they can't in the future get funding uh, because if you're doing production forestry it's, it's a rotating process and one would expect it to that these areas unlike landscaping uh, forestry would attract funding in the future and possibly throughout the growing period of the, this forestry. I think that laterally, that was just sort of a comment you were making at the end. There was no really a second question there. Am I right in thinking that? Are we yeah, well, I'm concerned that uh, the what's given... In terms of uh, any future management of forestry estate, um, it would be open to the landowner to uh, apply for forestry grants. Assuming, of course, that these forestry grants still exist at that time. No, well, thank you all for your questions and to the officers for answering them. I can now invite Councillor Lyle to move the report. Just um, before I begin um, moving the report in response to Councillor Anderson's query, I have some experience of this and um, if you feel <coughs> as a landowner that you're losing your capacity to um, apply for grants for forestry in the future, it would be part of the negotiation and the settlement agreed when the compulsory purchase of the land was acted on or during the negotiation for a settlement. Uh, 
Thank you, Deputy Provost. This report concerns the next stage in the Perth Transport Futures Project, Phase 2, the Cross Tay Link Road. As members will be aware, Phase 1 was the A9 A85 upgrade, which was completed in the spring of this year to national and international acclaim. That was the only ever one component of the comprehensive transport, Perth Transport Futures Project. Phase 2, to which this report relates, is the next step, which is essential in order to address the long-standing problems concerning congestion in and around Perth City and to realise <coughs> development land all in accordance with Tay Plan, the current Local Development Plan 2014 and its successor, Local Development Plan 2, which is now an, advantage, an advanced stage, which we've already heard this afternoon. While this report is seeking the Council's approval for the compulsory acquisition of the land, required for the Cross Tay Link Road, it is important to understand that extensive work has been undertaken and is continuing to be carried out to secure voluntary agreements with those affected landowners. The project team are confident that voluntary agreements will be reached in most, if not all, cases. However, as with any project of this scale, it is necessary to have the security of securing a compulsory purchase order. <coughs> of the type that's detailed. It is also important that this phase of the project proceeds without delay, as delay will only add to the overall cost. Accordingly, I am happy to move the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Duff to second the report? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Happy to formally second the report. Okay, thank you. Comments, please? Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I do worry here that we're perhaps guilty of trying to build our way out of congestion. Edinburgh has a fine city bypass, yet both it and the centre are highly congested only a few short years later. I wonder how long it will be before we in this chamber start to talk about the Perth Western bypass once the A9 there and the Broxton and Environment roundabouts end up full of local traffic from our new, new developments we discussed earlier at Perth West and at Bertha Park. It's a rhetorical question. I don't expect an answer today, and um, I'm happy to go along with the consensus. Thank you. Other comments? Are you happy to agree with the report? Thank you. I will now hand back to the Provost for the next paper. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, to page, it's uh, item nine, Treasury Act and Compliance Report 2019-20, quarter one. I'd like to invite Stuart McKenzie, Head of Finance, to introduce the report. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, councillors. This report advises Council of Treasury activity undertaken during the quarter ended 30th of June 2019. In total, £15 million pounds of new borrowing was undertaken during the quarter in accordance with the requirements of the approved capital programme. The Council's long-term debt, therefore, increased from £384 million to £399 million, with the average interest on this debt reducing from 3.2 to 3.16%. Investment activity was undertaken in accordance with the Council's cash flow requirements. The total level of investments increased from £50.8 million to £71.9 million, in part due to new borrowing. The average interest generated on investments increased marginally, with total investment income approximately £35,000 greater than in the previous quarter. There were no breaches in compliance with Treasury and investment policy, and all prudential indicators remain within approved limits. As detailed in Section 6 and Appendix 4 to the report, approval is sought for amendments to the Council's lending and investment policy. There are no proposed changes to who the Council lends to, which is in the main principal UK banks. It is, however, proposed to amend the investment limits with individual institutions to link this to the size of the Council's investment portfolio at any point in time. The intention is to ensure that the Council maintains an appropriate spread of investments and risk, whilst allowing flexibility to take advantage of current low PWLB borrowing rates and financing the approved £700 million pounds capital programme. Paragraph 6.9 of the report shows a comparison between the existing and proposed investment limits. Happy to take questions, Provost. 
Thank you, Stuart. Are there any questions? No questions? <laughs> Didn't think it's Stuart. <laughs> Councillor Donaldson. Right. This is becoming somewhat. Anyway, I've got. I've mm, oh, that's right. I've actually got two questions. Uh, the first is uh, somewhat different. It's on page 2032 and then also on page 2047 and it's the change in the limits. And the one, there's nothing, you know, I, th I think most of it's entirely uh, understandable. The one I do notice is category four and that's counterparty risk with other local authorities. And there you have doubled that from 10 to 20 million. Now, does that tell us something uh, in, in terms of change in policy? I'm also conscious of the fact it could be any local authority in the UK. There certainly are a number of local authorities south of the border that have been in serious financial problems. Probably the best example is, is Northampton. And we've also seen, it's quite a number of years back, the problems that occurred in the Western Isles. So could I just ask why that change in policy and how do you assess risk? Thank you, Councillor Donaldson, for your question. For a moment there, I thought I got off of it. Um, to answer your question uh, very briefly, um, essentially the, inc the increase in the proposed limit is simply to reflect the fact that we, we will have a larger investment portfolio because we're borrowing more money, because the capital programme is larger. So it isn't part to reflect that. It's just part of trying to make uh, the arrangements more dynamic. In terms of managing risk, um, we have fairly good intelligence, both um, as you could imagine as public finance professionals, but also um, within the sector and from our treasury advisors about what the relative risks might be in investments in other local authorities. And the examples they use are, are very good uh, examples of where we wouldn't, <coughs> I wouldn't seek necessarily to put money. That said, um, all local authorities do apologies, but there's a degree of certainty around investment. Uh, I have a second question, unless anyone else does. Oh. Not, not a supplementary. I think he, he's explained on that. It's reasonable enough. Thanks. It's actually important <laughs> in terms of the council's capital expenditure program going forward, and that's on interest rates, because we're, sh we're seeing the position here to uh, Stuart McKenzie to to the end of uh, uh, June, but the position on 30, 50 year money really has been quite dramatic. At one point, I think got down as low as 1.6, up to. <coughs> Would I be right in saying that if you were to borrow a million at present, the charge to revenue account would now be of the order of about 25,000 per annum? Thank you, Councillor Donaldson. As of today, uh, the rates for 50-year money um, were 1.62 per cent from, from memory. They've fallen again. Um, the uncertainty uh, in other chambers is causing some reaction in the market, which impacts on our borrowing rates. Um, in response to your second question, um, the figure of £25,000 would be if we were to borrow today at, at the very low rates we're currently experiencing for a specific project. But what we do when we quote figures in terms of, of the um, resource cost of managing capital expenditure is we quote the consolidated loans fund rate. And the reason we do that is because um, we need to recognise that whilst if we were to borrow at this point in time, we might experience very low interest rates, we're managing an investment, a capital portfolio now of over 400 million pounds. That's why you will see officers quoting the consolidated loans fund rate, um, which is a higher figure. However, as we continue 
comfortable at lower rates because all of the loans from the rate itself will come down. Right. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm looking at paragraph 3.3 .3 on page 2028. Uh, just for clarification, you, you say that no Public Works Loan Board loans maturing in the quarter, and, and yet, and, and, and those, as I understand it, are, are taken out at fixed rates, and, and yet the average rate on our portfolio with the PAWLB fell to 2.99. Is that simply as a result of the overall impact of the new £15 million pound borrowing? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Pallet. Um, that reflects uh, the comments I've just made about the actual consolidated loans fund rate following, uh, following, sorry, falling, my apologies, as a result of the council being able to borrow at lower rates over time. So, um, the way the council's borrowing works is we take out fixed rate loans. Um, there is uh, a repayment of, of interest and of interest over a period of time, and, they mat and is it matured to then, so you'll pay the principal mm. at the end of the loan. Um, but because we are borrowing um, more cheaply than we have done in previous years, the overall cost of our borrowing, the consolidated loans fund rate, goes down. Okay. And that's what you see in report after report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other further questions? Okay, Councillor Lyle, can you move the report? <coughs> Thank you, Provost. In line with best practice, elected members are provided with a quarterly update on Treasury management activity. This report sets out the activity for the period to 1st of April to 30th of June 19. The Head of Finance has already provided elected members with further commentary on the activity set out in the body of the report. Once again, Provost, I welcome the fact that there have been no breaches in compliance with the approved investment strategy. I also welcome the review of the approved lending and investment policy. The proposed changes will provide increased flexibility, minimise and spread our risk and also allow us to take advantage of the exceptionally low interest rates to deliver our 700 million capital program. The Council is asked to note the contents of the report and approve the ri revised lending and investment policy. I move the report. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Happy to formally second the report. Thank you, Provost. Can I first of all thank the finance team for this report? And I think I should mention, uh, he's not here today, John Jennings, and I'm grateful for the assistance he's given myself. It is a Treasury report, so it covers a whole round number of factors. I don't think the fall in interest rates is necessarily a good thing. It may be uh, something that's indicating the potential of recession going forward, but we, we have to see in that front. There's a question that's referred to of Brexit uncertainties, and we've even found out today that the Brexit update that all councillors were meant to receive next Monday is now going to be deferred, and I quote, due to the ongoing uncertainty over the EU exit process and timescales, and it's rescheduled potentially for mid-October. And I think it's just indicative and as we speak, events are unfolding at Westminster, but it is indicative of the total, complete and utter failure. And that is absolutely clear. It is a shambles, and it makes it very difficult for future planning. I also want to make the point on low interest rates. We, I've referred to it before, but that is that we can, even though it's got implications further out in terms of pension liabilities and the discount rate, well that's quite a technical thing. We got to look at the capital budget process. We can at present borrow on a rate of about 1.6, 1.7%. But you may remember at the time of the last capital budget, uh, the independent group put forward quite detailed proposals. 
We didn't agree with every aspect of those proposals, but there were clear proposals. The same from my own SNP group, detailed proposals, and in fact from the administration. We'll see what the Liberal Democrats are now going to come up with over coming months. But we got the administration's capital budget uh, motion, which very nearly was a blank sheet of paper. And as I think we all now know, uh, um, a blank sheet of paper is uh, uh, quite um, an interesting term in relation to this uh, Conservative government. But I do make the point on the capital budget. I think in terms of what we can do in terms of climate change initiatives, what we can do perhaps on PH2O, or what we can perhaps achieve in terms of capital funding for schools, we really do need to be much more uh, uh, innovative and forward-looking, and I think we've got the leeway to do that, especially if you can Councilor, lock into the money. Councilor so I do Councilor make the point, Donaldson. we need greater Councilor vision. Donaldson. If you look at paragraph 2.2 on the economic background, and I did study economics at college, UK unemployment remained around the lowest level since the 1970s. CPI inflation remained at 2%. Average earnings continued to grow and remained above the rate of inflation. Retail sales remained higher than the previous year whilst business investment and the housing market grew. That doesn't sound to me like a doom and gloom scenario. Thank you. Before I um, start, I think Councillor McCall wishes to make something you wish to. Yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Just to declare that I have a non-financial um, interest in this particular topic. Thank you. Glad you were not at the start of the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. There are... This is the review of school catering services. There are a number of officers here today who can answer questions, including Ian Waddell from Tayside Contract. So these will be there to answer the questions. No one is going to introduce this report. I'm just going to ask straight away are there any questions on the report before us? Sorry, I'd just like to say a few words of introduction uh, before I move uh, um, a motion. Deputy Provost, approval was given at Lifelong Learning. Sorry, Committee. point of order for the. the Leader of the Council just indicated he's planning on moving the motion. No, I think that uh, he's doing that later on. Sorry, okay, we're just thank you. doing a slight in, a short introduction. Then there'll be normal questions, and then there'll be moving of the motion. Okay. Approval was given at Lifelong Learning on the 30th of January 19 to the re recommendation that officers work with Dundee City Council, Angus Council, and TC Contracts in developing a process and a proposal associated with a Dundee-based central production unit. This approach was seeking to find an efficient model which would deliver the increased 400,000 early learning and childcare meals by August 2020 and to meet the required budget savings. 
On the 20th of February 19, the Council agreed total revenue recurring savings of 426,000 associated with the model of the central production unit at the Tay Cuisine in Dundee. It was also recognised that the Council would benefit from an additional 33,000 of unbudgeted surplus which could be returned to Perth and Kinross Council. <coughs> Since January 19, the concerns have been expressed about adopting this model, specifically the workforce implications, which has the CPU, which would have the CPU based in Dundee. Officers were asked to outline options available and in particular explore feasibility of locating a CPU in Perth. This paper is presented today for the Council to compare the options recognised in the approved budget savings on the future delivery of school catering services. And that's in concluding my introduction, I would say that senior officers of this council and colleagues from Tayside Contracts are now available to answer any questions. Thank you. My questions on the report. Councillor Coates. I don't know where to start because there are so many things that I, that I would pick holes in in this report, having spent a lifetime, 35 years, in food hygiene and food hygiene related businesses. One of the things that I pick up is in 2.1.2, and it's also in various other parts of the report, enhanced food safety through positive release testing. So you can only achieve this with Coop Trees food. How is all fresh food tested in any other walk of life? And then following that, we've got reduced environmental impact through the use of cars, vans, taxis. How can we safely deliver school meals by cars and taxis? I just don't see that that is a viable opportunity or way to do things. And that's only the start. I could go through this can report. Of course, could, this is not the stage for comments. This is a question. Have you got a direct question that an officer can answer, if you don't mind? Well, why can they only test frozen foods? OK, right, thank you. We'll get someone to answer. Or will an answer that qu question. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, test all foods. The difference between the CPU is that um, when it's fresh food, the testing is done, but the results come after the meals are delivered and consumed. In terms of the CPU, the meals would be uh, freshly cooked, glass frozen, the testing done at that point, and the results would be delivered before the meals were ever consumed. In terms of the second question, um, we already have a contract with Sheridan Myers through Scotland XL for delivering meals throughout Tayside at the moment and uh, some of that is done by cars, some by taxis, because bear in mind, uh, in Perthshire, you've got a very rural area, and we already have dining centres where meals are delivered to these, and that is the most economic way to do it, and it minimises the impact on the environment. Mr Forbes. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Provost. I, I hope in your new elevator position you'll be generous to me, because I have four questions. Is that okay? They're all fairly straightforward. Can I, or would you like me to? Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask one of the officers if uh, we we saw a report earlier on today that talked about the the uh, very low levels of unemployment in Perth and Kinross, and, and one would assume that that might lead to issues with recruitment. So if we don't go ahead with this, can we get some reassurance that we won't have any problems recruiting the additional? Um, I was going to call them dinner ladies. I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but staff. Devlin's going to take this one. Councillor Forbes, if you look at page, I think it's 2060 in the volume in relation to um, section 2.5, model 5, there is an indication there that there may be a challenge with recruitment associated with that model. Thank you for that. My second question, um, can I get some information from TSI contracts, who was consulted over this, what groups of people, whether it was unions, parents, school children, elected members, etc. 
with sorry with this option or all options with uh, with the frozen option please oh the frozen option uh, we have consulted with parents we've done testing sessions with parents we've done testing sessions with elected members uh, we've done uh, cons consulted with parent councils and we've consulted with our own staff and the trade unions as well Thank you. Um, we've talked a bit in the past about holiday hunger initiative, and I think there was a connection between um, the centralised kitchen and that process. C can any officers elaborate on whether, if we don't go ahead with this, it would have an impact on our ability to deliver that? Council Forbes, in relation to that, the, the two are not interdependent um, and the, the affordability in terms of extending the resilience and the ability to um, increase capacity with Model 1 would not exist, obviously, if we didn't have it. But what we have been able to do through the summer holiday period just passed and what we are planning to do in October is to offer a range of different um, activities relating to tackling holiday hunger some of whom, uh, some of which rather have been uh, generated and supported by the council and others have been able to be facilitated by council money but are being delivered by volunteers or third sector organisations. So the, the, there's um, a, a correlation but one does not depend on the other. Thank you very much. And my final um, question, the savings which range somewhere above £400 million. Pounds. Oh, to give us some context, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that would be an incredible, <laughs> that would be an incredible amount of money. Um, can, just to put that into context, can we get some information on what that would do to the ECS budget if we don't make that saving? Uh, I'll, I'll start and perhaps Greg Boland can, can come in and give you more detail if I'm not able to provide sufficient information. The, the savings have already been approved and will therefore come out of the ECS budget and they will, if the, this does not go ahead then there needs to be alternative means to find those, those savings. Is that as specific as you wanted, Councillor Forbes, or were you looking for something else? Sorry. Just, no, that's, that's absolutely fine. I think that makes sense. But what would that buy us? I mean, could equate it to something that we as elected members would understand. Um, the the four hundred and twenty six thousand pounds would equate roughly to the salaries for something like nine social workers between nine and ten social workers nine and ten teachers. Thank you very much. Mr. Lane. Thanks. A couple of questions following on from the answers there. Um, are, are are you saying that we have a food safety issue in the kitchens at the moment? Seem to be. No, I'm not saying we've got a food safety issue. What I'm saying is that it gives even more guarantees than it uh, has in place at the moment. We have we comply with all the HACCP uh, legislation, etc. So no, there's no problem. Thanks. And the other question was, just for clarity, um, you consulted with unions, parents, and uh, everybody, but was only on the option of the CPU in Dundee. Um, not on all the other options. So it would be hard to say that uh, everybody, would you agree, it would be hard to say that everybody, given the range of options, would think that that was the best option. Because I've had not one person uh, say to me that they thought that the CPU in Dundee was the best option, but plenty have said that fresh food would be. Uh, it's a lengthy answer. It would be necessary in that because obviously we've been through a whole lot of options looking at ways that we could deliver this service. And you're right, the um, consultation was to do with the CPU in Dundee. And uh, one of the things we need to dispel is that the food is freshly cooked using exactly the same ingredients as that are used at the moment. It will actually encourage uh, the use of local produce and then it's blast frozen. And uh, the myth is that there's going to be microwave ovens out there, which is, uh, is not true. Uh, having said that, yes, we've only consulted relation to the CPU in Dundee but in terms of the process, the consultation would be the same for the process, whether it was in Dundee or in uh, Perth, 
and the other one obviously is we're already providing the service that's option five. Thanks, so just for clarity, um, it doesn't really give any extra validity to option one, the consultation process, over, over any of the other options, really? No, we haven't done any more consultation after option one because it's just, it was the same process. So can you just say, though it gives no validity, extra validity to num option one? Yes or no? Uh, you're correct, yeah. Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. I have two, if that's okay, uh, unrelated. Um, de on options one, two, three, on options one, two, three, and four, I see there's an environmental benefit put as one of the uh, of the pros to this. Is there any additional information that you can give me as to how you've come up with that environmental benefit? There's, um, each of the options, we've looked at the amount of travelling that's having to be done to move the meals around. In terms of option one, you're using a much larger vehicle and we're in the process of procuring that at the moment. Uh, in option two, uh, three and four, uh, sorry, two, three and four, yes, uh, you will have different numbers of journeys. Now, what we've done is we've looked at every single school in uh, Perfink and Ross. We've looked at where the meals will be coming from and we've worked out the journey times that go with it and the journey um, miles that go with it. And that's how we've come up with the environmental impact. Thank you. Second question, which is, uh, is just a notice on page uh, 2061. Um, there is a mention of three, um, th three kitchens that, uh, school kitchens that will be reopened. Uh, it just begs the question, how many school kitchens have we actually closed over the last 10 years and when? Yeah, I can confirm we've closed 12 kitchens since 2012, and the last kitchen we closed were in 2019, and fairly equi equitable closure rate during that period. I noticed that... Um, Business continuity risk is associated with Model 5 when presumably we are retaining in use a large number of kitchens. But I notice that relative to Model 1, where the number of kitchens, as I understand it, is reduced to a minimum, there is no business continuity risk foreseen. Can someone explain why to me? Thank you. And the second, if I may, that any savings realised from um, Model 1, are those to be... Um, those savings are those to the benefit of just um, ECS, or will those be spread across the whole of the general revenue account? Thank you. <coughs> He's answering the first point. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer Simon. the first point. Thank you. Um, <coughs> in terms of business continuity, why there is a, an increased risk in option five is that every kitchen has a finite, what we would refer to, single shift capacity. And the volume of meals uh, for early learning and childcare that have to be added are going to add to um, the burden of capacity on an already stretched service. We do have capacity in kitchens where we don't need extra meals, and so the additional capacity will be farmed out to those kitchens. In so doing, we then reduce the capacity within the estate to respond to business continu continuity issues uh, such as equipment failure as we start to make every kitchen operate at a capacity level. Uh, so that's the, the risk with option five. Option one, is the, there is no real risk. E everything is being produced uh, in a central kitchen. No kitchens are really being closed. They all still have the necessary equipment to regenerate the meals from a central kitchen. Yes, just to clarify the, sorry, sorry, just to clarify the, the 426,000 is approved against the Education and Children's Services budget, which was approved in February, so that will go towards uh, balancing the budget for 21-22 uh, for Education and Children's Services. In addition, within the report, there's an additional 33,000 of surplus funds, which will come back to the corporate centre across to benefit the, the full council. Thank you, Thank you, Deputy Provost. So, 
I suppose my question is, are all the existing school kitchens going to be kept on standby um, in case of a catastrophic event at the central production unit? Thank you. The existing school kitchens are not going to close. All that's happening is that uh, the meals are not cooked fresh from these school kitchens, so we need less in the way of people out the, the delivering the, the meals up front. The service at the, the kitchens are the same, the facilities are the same, so the kitchens are still there. The challenge we've got under option five is that uh, a large number of the kitchens are already working at full capacity, and it's how we're going to be able to deliver the ELC meals uh, out of these uh, with the fact that we are also going to need another 41 people, which is going to make it even more challenging. Good. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, so I've got a number of questions as well. I think that's all right, um, but they are on distinctly different aspects. Uh, my first is, um, does th is the £426,000 uh, saving net of any loan charges for the share of the 1.9 million capital investment and in the CPU and the 100,000 pound <coughs> capital investment in uh, uh, the Parthic and Ross kitchens as a consequence of model one? I think Greg's going to answer that question. Uh, yes, Councillor Stewart, the, the 426 is net of the, 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 the capital investment of 1.9 million. Okay, thanks. Um, Second is uh, paragraph 1.1 uh, in the background uh, talks about the December 2016 report from the respective councils and NHS board setting out the potential for extended collaborative approaches between the above named organisations together with the third sector and private enterprises appropriate. I just wondered whether um, any of that, those collaborative approaches, um, the, the potential for any of those extended collaborative approaches had been explored um, with the NHS, with the third sector, with private enterprise, um, where were we with that? And, and, and the, the, because I don't see any mention of, of any follow-up to those um, approaches in the, the When we were asked to look at a business case for a CPU, uh, one of the things that was agreed, we would not try and uh, pad it out with income that we may or may not get. So the report and the figures you're seeing is based on the meals we get from uh, Perth and Kim Ross, and it's got nothing else added into it. <coughs> Having said that, the facility has the ability to operate uh, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, whereas the way in which the figures have been calculated is just normal five-day working week. Uh, so we've got a, a superb capacity out there. So once that facility is up and running, uh, we have got an opportunity to bring in income from other areas will, which will help to reduce the cost for the meals in Perth and Kim Ross. Uh, we've already had discussions with three different councils uh, who are interested, one's interested in particular in the provision of welfare meals out of there, and we have raised it at, uh, with some of the officers who go to the integrated joint boards as an option for looking at other opportunities to take that forward. Okay, thank you. I, I think I would have maybe expected if the report was approved in 2000, December 2016 that some of those um, discussions would have been a bit further um, advanced. Um, there's a question on, um, there's a reference to uh, council-owned uh, sites in Perth two currently available council owned sites in Perth, I think this is to do with Model 3, and I just wanted to check whether they were just land or whether they were uh, land and buildings. We've got a green light. <laughs> They're just land, Councillor Stewart, and in relation, if I may, to your um, your comment after Mr Waddle spoke, the paper th that is referred to in the background um, section at 1.1 is predominantly in relation to the Tayside Regional Improvement Collaborative and the Tayside Plan for Children, Young People and Families. But um, Mr Waddle has explained that there is other work that has been undertaken with other local authorities and with other agencies as well. 
Thank you. Okay, and last question, just following up on uh, Councillor Parrott's point about um, a ca catastrophic event, I had, I had made um, use of the note about in, in very similar language. What I don't see is, and I have asked this question before in, 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 in separate meetings, is uh, mention of, uh, in terms of the risks and cons, um, contingency for the case, and I, I just think it should be detailed in the report, um, contingency for the case of a catastrophic failure at the Tapazine um, uh, proposed CPU, because it is a single site, and while you know there might be the capacity to get to you know for 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 schools to last for a week on um, frozen stocks, and for contingency to come in quickly after that. Um, if it was a long-term catastrophic failure, wh what is, y it would seem to me that a more distributed <coughs> um, uh, model it has more contingency built into it than a single site. And I just wondered why there's no mention of, of that aspect in the risks and cons. In terms of the, if there was a catastrophic failure, uh, bear in mind the existing kitchens are still there they would now have uh, holding points for um, frozen food. So we could quite easily get the other kitchens up and running and move the staff out there and still hold the flat frozen food in them. So we've got much more uh, continuity opportunities out of the one site, out, out of the uh, um, existing kitchens. You're right, if you have two CPUs, you would have immediately another place to have a contingency at what cost would that be? Because I believe that the existing kitchens that are there will give you the certainty, will give you the guarantee that you will not be affected. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Deputy Provost. The angle I was going to come from has been well covered, so thank you. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Yes, um, uh, I've got two questions. Um, uh, as I go about uh, and talk to constituents, um, the, the, the biggest issue is the appeal of school meals at the moment um, is sort of stuttering on uh, the take-up. Um, will the central production unit um, make the, the offering you have more appealing to the children? Um, or, you know, how's that going to work out? The children shouldn't notice any difference whatsoever in terms of the meal that's delivered on the plate to them. Um, in terms of uptake, we just got some figures the other day that shows that uh, Perth and Kinross, excuse me a sec, has one of the highest uptake in terms of school meals across Scotland. Uh, in terms of primary uh, four to seven, for example, the Scottish average is 50%, Perth and Kinross is 54%. Now, you've got very good uptake what we've got to ensure is that we maintain that uptake and I can't guarantee until the meals are actually delivered. All I can say is out of all the trials that we've done in terms of the tasting sessions, it's been extremely difficult for anyone to tell whether a meal has been uh, glass frozen or not glass frozen. So it's our intention to try and ensure that more and more children do take the uptake. We're also aware that changes are happening with the food legislation and in terms of 2020, there's going to be other reductions in what we can and cannot serve. And that's a challenge in itself. And it's a thing that we all have to try and promote with the children to maximise the uptake. My second question, um, it, I mean, I, I saw in another paper that the Perth and Kinross is uh, 2,041 square miles. Um, you're on about one vehicle delivering, I think it's once a week, um, do you think that's achievable that the one vehicle can cover all the schools in which is a big county? It's a big area. Are you confident that this can be achieved? The one vehicle will be delivering out from um, the Tay Cuisine Centre in Dundee out to the holding hubs. There are other transports that are done between the hubs and the um, the dining centres and the, there's mini hubs as well. So there's other, it's not just one vehicle, it's one vehicle out of Dundee. There's a second thing associated with that. Bear in mind that every day we are getting supplies from 
some uh, companies like Breaks into nearly 200 schools throughout Tayside. We are also speaking to these companies to say when they're making these journeys, we are looking for them to deliver some of the add-on bits that we are going to need to minimize unnecessary journeys that should help the climate and uh, reduce costs as well. So basically you're saying it's, it's a partial, CPU is not a complete um, a unit where everything's done by, it's partial. No, we've, sa we've said that from the start. The CPU will uh, cook 70% of the meal. Um, it's cooked at the center, it's blast frozen, it's put out then to distribution hubs. In, in these hubs, uh, some of them will then cook the other 30% for that school. Others will cook uh, less than that because you, there are certain things don't travel well. Some of the vegetables, some of the uh, ad, um, chips or something, which we can't use very often, <coughs> I have to say. But yeah, these are all added in at either the uh, distribution hub it goes into or at some of the mini hubs. So it's 70% is the figure you need to think about as being cooked in uh, Thai cuisine. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor McDade. Um, I would just like to take up the point that was a supplementary to Councillor Anderson's question about uptake of school meals. And I attend the Joint Committee uh, on Tayside Contracts. And at every committee I've been at recently, there's been a decreasing uptake of school meals, particularly in Perth and Kinross, and in free school meals. And I have raised that subject at the Joint Committee, so I'm a bit intrigued as to why you know, that, hasn't, that didn't comprise a part of your answer, because it is a concern that those of us across party attend <coughs> TSA contracts are co extremely concerned about the uptake of school meals under the current system. It's not just a, a reduction in uh, Perth and Kinross, uh, it's right across Scotland. And one of the things is, was to do with the changes that came in in terms of the healthy eating legislation. Uh, there's a reduction in the amount of uh, red meat, etc., that can go into that. So these figures that I was quoting there have just come out from the Scottish Government and there will be figures that will be going to the next meeting of the Joint Committee. Uh, so it, it, it is a challenge because it's a change of an attitude of children and it's not just uh, the provider like Tayside Contracts is working with uh, education departments and professionals there about how we can try and encourage children to eat more healthily. Do you wish to add something to it? If, if I may, Councillor McCall, just add, add something to that. We do have the information that's come from the most recent census in relation to the uptake of meals. And currently, for primary one to three for Perth and Kinross, it's an 83% uptake, which is broadly on a par with Angus and is above that in Dundee and is above the Scottish average. For primary four to seven, that drops to 54% as an uptake. And that kind of drop, you're absolutely right, continues to be a concern, not just in Perth and Kinross, but actually that's the, the rate in Dundee and Angus, and in fact the Scottish average in the most recent census was 50%. So there, there are issues around the continuation of relatively high uptake um, at some stages, but there's always going to be room for improvement. But a drop from 83 to 54 is a concern. You, you are absolutely right. In terms of our secondary schools, uh, um, in relation to the most recent census information, it was sitting at 61%. Um, and against the Scottish comparator of uh, average, rather, of 45%, relative to that, we're obviously doing better. But again, that is relatively low in terms of uptake. So you're absolutely right. And I would say that regardless of what model is adopted, then s we will want to continue to focus to make sure that uptake of school meals is as high as it can possibly be. Yes, okay, I'm being very generous today. Yeah, yeah. I think the other part of my point on this is that the uptake of free school meals in Perth and Kinross is much lower than elsewhere. And it is my firm belief, and I have raised this subject before at TSA Contracts, so it's not, you know, it's not a, a secret, but I honestly do believe that being able to address the issues locally with the parents and what can be done to remedy that, because we ha we're having a paper later on in this <coughs> council meeting about child poverty and uh, the fact that children who are entitled to free school meals in Perth and Kinross is much lower than the other two areas. 
It's a huge concern. I've never received a satisfactory response to that. And I think that that absolutely is a consideration. Um, and I would be very astonished if suddenly we were on a par with Angus and Dundee on this matter. Thank you. Councillor okay, McDeed. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I, I have a number of questions, if that's okay. Um, first, I'd like to clarify a question that Councillor McCall asked earlier um, around the number of kitchens that have been closed. Um, can you give us a bit more details about uh, <coughs> were these because of school closures or were these just through efficiency savings as part of the current you know, operation? Um, and could any of these be reopened <coughs> if there is capacity issues? Sorry, Councillor McDoud, I, I missed the second part of your question there. Could any of the closed kitchens, if they're in operating schools, be reopened to deal with capacity issues? Thank you. Yeah, all, all, the, all the kitchen closures I refer to are nothing to do with school closures. These are pure efficiency measures at the time. Um, it's already um, built in for uh, option uh, two and five. Uh, there will be at least three of these closed kitchens reopened. The main part of my question is around um, it's the second bullet point on page uh, 2061 of the papers um, where it talks about uh, the council would require to identify a recurring uh, alternative savings amounting to 426,000. Um, now, I've been to a number of meetings uh, where this the CPU has been discussed and at one of them there was a figure of, I think, about 110,000 which was mentioned as a savings that would be generated regardless of whether the CPU went ahead or not on the basis of the increased number of school meals um, providing greater economies of scale. Now, the next paragraph talks about economies of scale, um, and it talks about increased overhead costs, um, and it talks about transport costs. I'm not quite sure why there's increased transport costs, because the transport costs, as we discovered during some of these meetings, are borne by the suppliers under option five, whereas they're borne by us under the CPU options. Um, I'm also curious about the over increased overhead costs. Generally, with economies of scale, the point of an economy of scale is that each unit gets cheaper, not more expensive. So if you could explain that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. answer the overhead one for you. The, if you choose, choose to go with option five, that means that we will have to operate with two completely different models for delivering school meal services across Tayside. So that means the way in which we have to manage that, the way in which we have to um, have the food nutritionists, etc., is going to increase our, our overhead costs of providing these school meals to service to you. So that has an effect on the cost of the meals. to all of my questions. I'm quite happy to re-ask the parts that weren't answered, such as the increased transport costs. Um, at previous meetings, we were explained that actually under the current system, transport costs are borne by our suppliers, whereas <coughs> under the CPU option, we were going to have to bear them. So could we be explained as to why there's going to be increased transport costs um, for us under option five? Transport costs are twofold. One, uh, if a supplier is delivering food to school kitchens, etc., uh, built into their contract is the cost of delivery. In terms of the transport costs that are included within this, is that even if you go with option five, there will still be transport costs uh, out to dining centres because they don't have their own produ uh, production kitchens at the moment. And with the fact that you're going to have 400,000 more meals there is going to be more food that's transported out, uh, admittedly cooked to these dining centres, but there are costs that go with that as well. Chris? Um, yes, yeah, a follow up on that. Um, but again, the economies of scale argument would apply there where if you're delivering more meals in the same vehicle, that actually it's less per unit. So I'm still quite confused about that. And my final point was around, and it's been touched on by a number of other councillors around um, the business continuity risk. Um, and I'd wondered if the percentage of commercial and industrial fires compared with other buildings had been taken into account uh, in the compilation of this option, because my 
uh, understanding, I think, is that industrial fires are much more common, much more uh, likely to happen, um, and therefore there's much greater risk to the business continuity. Um, well, we've been operating Tay Cuisine for the last 15 years, uh, so it's a facility that's uh, been there a long time, haven't had any issues there. Um, I'm not sure whether industrial fires in uh, buildings like that are more relevant, uh, pertinent or not. The point I was trying to make is your kitchens will still be there. So you've got the facility to cook the meals fresh if we had a, a catastrophic failure. You also will have the facility to have the uh, deep freezers that are in there, or special freezers that are in there to hold these meals that you don't have at the moment. So that's where you've got an, an added continuity element. I accept the fact that if you've got economies of scale, you will make savings. What we have done is highlighted all the schools within uh, Perth and Ross and what we think the meals delivery will be and the frequency of these. And we've worked out what the cost is um, with the extra 400,000 meals and what the costs are at the moment. Because one of the areas is you may at the moment be delivering them with uh, s uh, small vans and because of the number of meals going out, it may be a larger vehicle, but we've done it for school by school and we've got all the figures that go with that if you're needing any more information. That would be very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Now, Councillor Lane, you've already asked a question. You want to ask something else or were you just shaking your head in disgust? <laughs> no. I did hear you, Dr. caught me unawares there because I was in my, uh, I'm trying to think what my question was. Yes, it was, is mm -hmm. it, uh, if we're going to have these kitchens that we're not using, uh, just ready to go if there's a, 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 a catastrophic failure, uh, is it built in the, the part testing, the upgrade of the equipment, that's all, all been taken into the figures that, we, that we've got, that these, these mach all that mach uh, will be regularly checked and ready to go and clean, et cetera. Some of the equipment will, would have had to be part tested after it, etc. But bear in mind that these will be holding kitchens. The kitchens will still be operating. It will only be uh, some of the um, the number of people that are operating out of them will be less work that comes out of them. The equipment will be in the main the same. Having said that, you won't be doing the full element of the cooking. So mm -hmm. some of the ovens will be decommissioned. They will still be there. But uh, if you have a catastrophic failure. You then have a plan in place to make sure that you test and regularly test the uh, specific kitchens that you will need. Thanks, and you have figures for, for what that will entail, the ongoing maintenance. <coughs> I haven't got any specific figures here, sorry, but we would be able to provide that, yes. Councillor Duff, and then Councillor Dugan, and that will be the end of questions because I think you've had long enough to. Councillor Duff. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, my question relates to one of the potential benefits of uh, Model 1, and that was about the potential capacity for further expansion and income generation for the Council uh, if market opportunities present itself. And I wondered um, if uh, or what other of the options had that potential capacity benefit? <coughs> Um, options one, two, effectively three and four, if, if they went ahead, would have that capacity benefit. Option five doesn't, because that's operating out of the existing kitchens. But option one, uh, and the reason I'll answer a question that was raised before about why haven't we progressed this further? Well, until we know that uh, the CPU is definitely going ahead, we couldn't agree anyone's, uh, speak to anyone about contracts or terms of delivery because we couldn't guarantee when the delivery would start. Uh, having said that, at the moment, um, we are having to work in the background to do with the option one because Dundee and Angus uh, are intending to go down that way. So we're on target, we're on cost, um, but we need a decision from yourselves about whether Perth and Kinross are in, and that would then have an effect on how quickly we could try and grow that element of the business. Councillor Dugan. Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Can I ask um, the colleagues from Tayside Contracts for uh, clarity and indeed your confirmation that um, should the Council decide to go with option five and invest in its current um, school <coughs> kitchen estate, uh, that it is absolutely possible 
um, uh, uh, that we can develop uh, greater efficiency and savings from maximising efficiencies through uh, Model uh, 5, uh, particularly taking into account the increased demand from additional school meals from 1140 hours uh, childcare. <coughs> Accepting the capacity constraints as our estate exists at the minute, but on the broader principle, it is possible, is it not, to improve our estate and the efficiency therein going forward? You might have to repeat some of that, Councillor Duggan. Um, yeah, it's, per it's perfectly possible. Uh, we, we've highlighted. That's it. Short and sweet. Thank you very much for all your questions and to the officers for answering them. I will now ask Councillor Lyle to move the report. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Uh, given the extensive uh, nature of the questioning, I tend to be brief and say that the Conservative administration supports Model 1 in the paper. This option delivers the agreed budget savings included in our 2019 budget, and none of the other alternatives deliver that. Model, also, model 1 also delivers the largest reduction in energy as it requires the lowest number of food miles throughout Trayside. I'm happy to move and support the paper on option one and plan to end my comments there. I have one other short comment to make, given Councillor Donaldson's inappropriate, in my view, comments earlier. And using his assumptions, £400,000 revenue savings and ECS would finance the Blair Gary Recreation Centre. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Can I, can I invite Councillor Shire to second the paper? Thank you, Deputy Provost. I don't intend to be brief. Um, Councillor McCall, I'll start off with a, a comment to Councillor McCall, um, and that is, I don't think you quite know what is coming down the tracks with the new school meals, which have proved really unpopular. I take the opportunity to go into schools um, on a regular basis, and when I'm there, I always take the opportunity to have lunch, if I can, with um, and sit with some of the pupils. And I always try and sit with the younger pupils as well, because they'll tell you anything. Um, and we'll be very blunt with you about what they're getting on their plate. And the, the, the new uh, the guidelines that the Scottish Government have given for uh, new school meals, which Tayside contracts have been at the vanguard of uh, bringing forward, are really problematic. Um, so any drop-off in, in school meals, I would, I would attest, would be related to that. And I'd be really interested to know what um, consultation the Scottish Government did with stakeholders about those meals. Um, because they certainly didn't speak to the little chaps and chapesses that I spoke to who were very unhappy. Um, but moving on to seconding the paper, um, we all know how we've got here. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, budget decisions taken back in 2016 under a previous SNP administration. A number of councillors in the chamber were part of that administration at the time. Um, and that the, the subsequent uh, savings that have been, been agreed as we were moving towards the development of the central kitchen, I don't like the word CPU, sorry Ian, uh, to serve Tayside. This has led us to where we are today and I'd like to thank Ian Waddle um, and his staff at Tayside Contracts and Greg Boland from ECS for the huge amount of work put into developing a school meal service that will deliver nutritious and high quality meals, environmental improvements through reduced vehicle movements and energy usage in kitchens, and allow us to achieve our ambition of using more fresh local produce from suppliers within Perth and Penrose. This will also allow us to meet the huge demands of additional preschool meals, and importantly, the hundreds of thousands of extra meals at ELC expansion will require. We can also expand our offer to some of the most vulnerable families through our efforts to ta tackle holiday hunger, and aim to provide hot lunches through the holiday period with the additional capacity the central kitchen will give us. As you've heard from the various statistics uh, discussed this afternoon, Perth and Kinross has got an excellent record of having the third highest uptake in secondary school meals of all mainland local authorities. And our primary uptake with the issues that we have discussed is still well above the Scottish average. Our school kitchen staff are fantastic and we value them greatly. All but a small number, and we know we can manage this through staff turnover and other opportunities within ECS, will still be there when the shutters go up in school dining rooms. And the youngsters, such as my children, experience where they absolutely adore the school uh, kitchen staff, will still be the same as it is now. 
My concerns are that if we don't progress, we will suffer an, all, an, an already at capacity service, struggling to meet the massively expanded demand, struggling to recruit 41 staff at the same time in a sector we already struggle to recruit in, and a failure to meet the £426,000 every year recurring saving, and a situation where we'll watch our neighbouring authorities progress without us and potentially um, uh, having the commercial opportunities that we won't get a part of. I would urge all councillors to think very carefully about the risk laid out in 2.52 of, of, of the paper before you today and ensure that we all make a sensible, well-evidenced decision. Thank you. Are there any comments? Councillor McCord. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, having worked in the distribution industry for 14 years, I'm well aware of the benefits to the environment of a central distribution network. The central kitchen as a point for, de uh, for deliveries, reducing fre frequency of movement and reducing quantity of vehicles on our roads, we have an opportunity to seriously add a positive change to our carbon pollutants with this proposal. We have as elected members been advised time and time again by school children protesting on our streets, by marches and environmental lobbying, that we should do more and that we have to do more and that change isn't going to happen by one in all encompassing event, but will take small sensible changes adding to each other to achieve an environmental goal. A central kitchen will not only provide the impact of uh, reduce the impact of transport carbonization, but will localize any carbon footprint issues with regard to food storage, preparation and cooking. Again, more points adding to our climate change goal. I was glad to hear earlier on Councillor Donaldson already mention this Council's commitment to the climate change emergency, and again referring to climate change initiatives that need to come forward. We have all agreed that we have an emergency and, and tough decisions will have to be made, and this is a case of this at its core, and I am more than happy to support motion of option one. Thank you. Councillor Dugan. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. I've listened uh, very carefully to um, what I consider in large part to be sincerely held views about um, the way in which we should proceed with the models that have been put forward before us, but I don't agree with the Leader of the Council on this issue. Uh, and I've prepared an amendment to go before Council and I'd appreciate that recess for the Thank you. I think we'll just give you a few minutes to read the amendment and we will just continue. Okay. okay. Five minute recess as a, as a comfort break rather than five minutes.
Sorry. Councillors, can you take your seats, please? That's five minutes plus. Councillors, councillors, okay, thank you. Councillor Dugan, can I ask you to move your amendment? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, the, this uh, amendment prepared by the SNP group agrees recommendations one and two, um, but then goes on to delete recommendation three and replace it with approves model five as set out in the report with the rejection of the CPU delivery model for Perth and Kinross in favour of developing the existing infrastructure and service delivery. In setting the council's forthcoming revenue and capital budget commits the council to manage the unrealised approved savings of 426,000 as set out in the report and likewise any additional revenue and capital costs of implementing model five currently adds a further recommendation for which commits officers through a working group to draft a framework for continuous improvement, greater efficiency and higher uptake of school meals. This group will, as a matter of urgency, begin benchmarking across Scotland those successes delivered in other local authorities' school meal service which will form the basis of a report to the Modernising Governance MOG eh, eh, Member Officer Working Group and then back to full council at the appropriate time. Deputy Provost, I move that amendment 
in the firmly held belief that it's in the best interests of this service in Perth and Kinross and therefore um, in the interests of young learners, their parents um, and school staff both within and out with <laughs> I note, as we all must, that Angus and Dundee City colleagues have uh, uh, approved and progressed with their pursuit of a central production solution um, to a uh, school meal provision for their communities, and I wish them well in that endeavour. Uh, this is not about uh, an ideology, and it's um, certainly not about uh, we know best here in Perth and Kinross, but we do know best for Perth and Kinross in Perth, uh, here, and that's uh, what I'm seeking to advance with this amendment. I want to thank um, uh, colleagues from Tayside Contracts. I've had uh, possibly more than people realise meetings with colleagues from Tayside Contracts on this matter uh, and I've sought to understand uh, their thinking and ambition from taking this forward uh, and I've also undertaken to clarify comments that I've made in this chamber in the past um, which may not have uh, sounded to Tayside Contracts colleagues in the way that I'd intended and that's water under the bridge and I've clarified those um, comments and it, it's important that we understand that whatever the solution is in Perth and Kinross, it will be delivered by Tayside They're our partners in, deli in delivering the vital service of um, school meal provision and there's nothing in anything that we're proposing today uh, that seeks to um, even review, much less change that. The convener of um, uh, the Lifelong Learning Committee uh, made her views um, very clear, as she invariably does, and whilst I respect those, I also respectfully disagree um, with them. Um, I think in pursuing any of the available models, we should always reserve the right to undertake a mantra of continuous improvement, both in quality and efficiency of any service that we apply to school meal provision. And for a new PA system in here. <laughs> I'm very grateful uh, that we've had officers that have clarified for us uh, today that the vital work undertaken um, uh, in holiday hunger is not dependent on a central production unit solution. I think one of the main concerns that we have clearly, and the leader of the council touched upon it, in his introduction is the impact that this will have on um, uh, kitchen staff, many of whom uh, rely on the hours afforded by a role working in a school kitchen, which will allow them to facilitate their child caring and other, uh, other types of caring responsibilities. I've been in meetings where I've um, listened to clarity over the uh, situation whereby the grades that we need to have uh, attrition in are not necessarily uh, the grades that we have the highest turnover in and whilst I'm confident that Tayside contracts would be able to reconcile that imbalance I'm not certain that it would be a positive development for um, communities and I think um, just to touch again a, a little bit on what the uh, uh, convener of lifelong learning um, said in her um, uh, 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 advocating for the central production unit about um, what's happening in, in neighbouring authorities and she's, she's right and I've, I've accepted that this is what's going to be the, the, the prevailing uh, service provision in Angus and in Dundee but it's certainly not the prevailing dynamic in Highland or Aberdeenshire or Stirling or Fife and they are also neighbouring authorities of Perth and Kinross. If we want to develop the very best services for Perth and Kinross then we need to look north, south and west as well as east because if we've not learned anything as a council in the last two and a half years, it's that solutions may lie in Dundee or in fact Angus, but that's not inevitable and that we need to make that um, very clear. But in making that point, I want to assure people in this chamber and outside more importantly, that this is not about uh, primacy or you know, it's good for other people, it's not acceptable for Perth and Kinross. We have to look uh, very deep uh, and very carefully about the competing um, uh, merits and demerits of the various models and come up with what we think is uh, the best for Perth and Kinross and I believe <coughs> that that's model five and I hope that a majority of colleagues on this council will agree with me and that we can give uh, the CPU um, to those that want it 
and I don't believe that that's in Carpentry and Ross. Thank you. Secretary. Are you, are you just formally seconding? Uh, no, I'm going to speak oh. to it if that's okay. Yes. Thank you, Deputy Provost. May I briefly just um, welcome you to your new role and wish you all the best. The best. Um, but I would like to second this motion for three reasons, really. Uh, firstly, it is about the 50 posts that will be lost by accepting option one, um, and it's jobs that suit working families because of the natural association with their childcare needs, and these jobs are very important both to our rural communities and our local urban ones. Secondly, it's about the message that our young learners might take from this method of food delivery, and it's the wrong one, frankly. And thirdly, it is about the bespoke relationship that our dinner ladies, and I will call them dinner ladies because that's by and large what they are, it is about the relationship that our dinner ladies have with our young learners. The Scottish Government guidelines on healthy eating and nutrition are valid and important and indeed vital, both in terms of the health of our children and the climate change implications of eating less meat. I entirely accept that it's culture change and it's difficult. That makes the bespoke relationship even more crucial because we will have to deliver these changes with pragmatism and practicality uh, and flexibility as well. And I don't believe that the method of food production as prescribed in option one will be either pragmatic or flexible and therefore I am delighted to support Councillor Goodman's amendment. Thank you. Are there any comments? Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I fully support this amendment. It's fantastic when we can achieve a saving by working collaboratively with neighbouring authorities to deliver what our residents want. However, the emphasis must be on what our residents want. During the period over which this change has been under discussion, residents have told us loudly and clearly that they just don't want their kids being fed pre-made frozen school meals. They want their meals prepared locally to the greatest possible extent. We simply must listen to the views of residents, not least the 3,067 people who have signed Councillor Dugan's petition on the matter and the many others who have approached us all personally. Yes, it will cost us more to make quality meals locally, but isn't that why Perkinton Ross exists as a separate and autonomous local authority to its neighbours? We are here to do right by our residents, and I encourage all other councillors to give careful consideration to that fact when deciding this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, back in 2016, well before most of us were here, the SNP set the same. Maybe if we took option five, we could use some of the saving to get the PA system that Councillor Dugan was looking for earlier on. Um, so that, pro that proposed saving is currently half a million pounds, a huge sum of money that could be well used within ECS for other purposes, as Sheena just outlined for us. However, it seems that having set the savings target, whilst in administration, the SNP have decided they no longer want this. Councillor Dugan has consistently said this has nothing to do with frozen meals, it's all about jobs. Well, option two, an option I would be willing to support, eliminates the job losses, but still delivers substantial savings. This amendment, Deputy Provost, is a crazy idea, thrown together at the last minute, that's simply kicking the issue down the track for us to try and figure out at some later date. So vague is this proposal, I'm surprised it's even been deemed competent. For Councillor Donaldson to rant on about a blank sheet of paper earlier is absolutely ridiculous, set against this amendment, which seems to have been cobbled together on the back of an old menu. The proposal is not to pull the ready meal from the freezer, punch it four times with a fork, microwave it, then throw it on the table. And anyone who thinks that's the case is sadly misguided. All councils in Scotland are under pressure to deliver an additional huge number of school meals, as well as saving money. This plan will help us to achieve that objective and help with the holiday hunger agenda. My real concerns are around the delivery of this proposal. What will happen, Deputy Provost, if we have sickness in one kitchen, perhaps reduction issues in another? What then? Where do the school meals come from? This should really be beyond politics, Deputy Provost. This is real world stuff, delivering a fundamentally important service to young people. And every expert we have heard from agrees this is the right way to do it. There comes a time when we must listen to the experts who are employed to advise us. None of us are experts in delivering school meals. If this amendment passes, it will be a sad day for this council. 
And if the wheels fall off the food cart, the, then the blame for that will lie firmly with the people who supported the amendment. This amendment is mealy mouth rubbish, talking about a working group and some future savings proposal, absolutely no detail on how and when it will be delivered. To pass this amendment would be absolutely crazy, but it appears that may be what we're about to do. To be frank, Deputy Provost, this is absolute mince and it's not even frozen mince. Councillor McDade. Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, uh, just to follow on from Councillor Forbes' remarks, I've not actually heard anyone on this side of the chamber actually mention politics about this. And Councillor Dugan, actually, in his remarks and moving motion, was quite clear about his respect for those who disagreed with him. Um, and I think your own remarks were actually quite disrespectful to members on this side of the chamber. I think you might want to reflect on that. Um, in my ward, anyway, when I have been going around speaking to parent councils and community councils, uh, they have unanimously been against this proposal. In fact, they uh, were strongly against it. Um, and we have a very rural ward, and you know, jobs are quite hard to find often, um, and particularly school time jobs are very hard to find in general, but in the rural area in particular. So in some cases, these are the only school time jobs in these areas. Um, and I think I absolutely share what Councillor McCall said earlier about we want to have you know, reduced fuel, uh, food miles, um, and we want to see more local production. And I would love to see our children in our schools engaging with the food process more, as they do in many of the schools in my ward, and actually helping produce some of the food that's actually going to go into those meals so they understand what the food production process is. Um, and I think there's a lot of work that we can do about that. And I think as young people are engaging more in the environmental issues, that will happen. Um, and I think there's opportunities around that. But for me, this is about uh, very much keeping rural jobs in rural areas. It's very much about keeping the food as fresh as possible. It should be that we should be aspiring to the highest possible standards. I don't think that our children should perhaps receive frozen meal. I mean, I, I have to say, I'm a Kiveth, I've never had a frozen meal in my life. You know, I've been very lucky that I come from a home where I've always had a home cooked meal every night. Um, and, you know, actually, uh, there are a lot of children who are not in that situation and they might only get frozen meals at home. And actually, the school lunch is the most important meal for them in the day. And I think they should be getting the freshest possible food. So, on that basis, and consistent with you know, say various times as I come up to meetings, um, I'm going to be voting in line with the amendment to keep the uh, to reject the CPU and keep production local. Um, and I still have, I mean, I've seen this paper about five times. I've still got questions that I haven't had answers to. Um, and I think that actually speaks a lot of volumes. Very much. Councillor Purvis. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Um, I'd just like to set out my um, thoughts on this. Personally, I don't have any issue with um, the concept of having a, a centralised production unit um, and having frozen meals. I think that um, we should be careful that not to um, suggest that all types of frozen meals um, are bad. Um, they can be very healthy meals as well, um, and there is some of the benefits of, of um, when you freeze things straight after harvesting or production. Um, so I'd just like to make that as a first point. I also don't have a particular issue with um, job losses um, in, in the local area. I think that we shouldn't be protectionist if we can actually um, find uh, better and more efficient ways of doing things. Um, we do have a very um, high employment rate in Perth and Kinross, so I don't think that if we can deliver things um, in uh, Perth and Kinross uh, or in other areas uh, more cheaply, then that shouldn't necessarily be a consideration. However, um, I have tried uh, repeatedly to um, convince uh, people in the local community, at community council meetings, at parent council meetings, um, and constituents that I think that this is the right approach because of the significant amount of savings that it generates. Um, and usually, um, not to blow my own trumpet, but I am usually able to, if uh, people are unhappy about something, um, convince them that uh, after um, some consideration that it might be the right thing to do. But I haven't been successful on a single occasion in selling this proposal to any of my constituents and have had um, a very significant amount of correspondence um, from uh, normal constituents or members of parent councils or community councils um, and we are here as um, servants um, of the people and our constituents and while personally I don't have an issue with this proposal given the significant strength of feeling in the local community I don't think that it would be right for us to continue with this proposal given that there is such strong opposition.
One of the um, particular considerations that I took into account when reflecting on this in paper that's coming forward today is that people actually said they would be willing to pay more for their school meals rather than have them frozen. Um, and if that's something that our constituents are prepared to do, then who are we to say that we would rather take savings um, and give them frozen meals if they're actually willing to pay? Um, having looked at budget papers from previous years, the 2017 uh, budget papers and the proposals that were brought forward by officers, a full cost recovery of school meals would generate about £520,000. We have already um, put forward two uh, £32,000 savings of five pence increases, which is a total of £64,000 um, in uh, the previous year and the current financial year. Um, so um, that would still generate about uh, £456,000. I'm not saying that all of the money, because obviously this amendment doesn't commit specifically to how those um, additional funds would be generated, but in theory, with full cost recovery of school meals, which people um, obviously having the uh, exceptions for people who um, are entitled to free school meals that constituents have said they're prepared um, to pay, we would be able to cover the, the full cost of that. And that's just one example of how we would be able to do it. Um, so while personally I'm, I might not have an issue with this, given that the strength of feeling in the local community and that people are um, very unhappy about this proposal um, and would like to see um, f meals continue to be cooked freshly in our school kitchens, um, I will therefore, on that basis, support the amendment. Deputy Provost, um, I've already congratulated you privately on your appointment and I do so in public now and I wish you well. Um, I'm you. delighted that the minority Conservative administration have had the backbone to propose option one and I support it fully. I supported it when I was part of the joint administration and I still support it. And I'm proud to do that for a number of reasons. First of all, <coughs> there's a lot in this policy and it's still to make. Thank you. Keep me right, that's good. Um, nearly every family uses frozen meals part of the time, sometimes. It's highly unusual um, for that not to happen. And I was, stood shoulder to shoulder with Councillor Duggan at the tasting and neither he nor I could work out the difference between the frozen meals and those that had been freshly cooked that morning. We both admitted that to each other at the time. So I think the quality of these meals is not in question. Councillor Bailey made a point that we need to, I think, follow the crowd. Sometimes we need to exercise Deputy Provost leadership and take a lead in these things. And I think we've a responsibility to do that both to ourselves and to our future generations. If we go for option five, which I think is the worst possible option of, of them all, um, then we will be failing the opportunity to local suppliers who can supply um, centrally to uh, the CPU unit in Dundee, but would find it very difficult to go from local supplies to every single kitchen within Perth and Canross. And I think we're turning our back if we vote for option five on that possibility. £426,000 a year approximates to roughly half a percent of council tax, um, give or take uh, a shilling or two, every year. And we've had no explanation from the SNP group as to how they would manage this, except we'll, it'll need to be met from the budget. Of course it needs to be met from the budget. We will hit the budget review process half a million pound down, Deputy Provost, before we even begin to open the book. As far as jobs are concerned, yes, of course they're important, but the expansion of early years, childcare and turnover and other job opportunities in the council and in Tayside contracts, I believe, would allow people to be able to gain employment, perhaps at different <coughs> grades, at different hours in their own locality. I think that the option one is the best option for holiday meal provision, and Caroline Shires referred to that quite correctly. I think the quality is there. I think the opportunity to provide dietary needs in a controlled way is there, um, Deputy Provost. And I think a way of tackling the future demands that will be placed upon us about the Scottish Government's new proposals for the provision of school meals, which are just emerging after some fairly non-consultative, I think Caroline Shires said, um, process is important. I strongly support option one. We should go for that. We should turn our back 
on going backwards. We should look forward. Thank you. Councillor Duck. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, as we've heard, our colleagues on the other side of the chamber set up the review of catering services in 2015 and subsequently in the budget of February 2016 accepted a saving of £200,000 from this review. Our budget proposals earlier this year extended that budget saving to £426,000 by working in partnership with Angus and Dundee City Councils to establish a central kitchen to provide meals. These meals will deliver a great many benefits in terms of food quality, food safety, economies of scale, productivity, efficiency, capacity, choice, dietary needs, waste reduction, nutrition, energy savings, environmental benefits from a reduction in our carbon footprint, and a greater ability to deal with food insecurity for the most vulnerable families uh, in Perth and Kinross through supporting food provision during holiday time. If supported, the amendment from the opposition not only undoes that opportunity to make a saving of £426,000 and forgo a potential return of a surplus £33,000, but increases the current transport cost by a further estimated £83,000 and unspecified additional labour costs, resulting in a budget pressure now of over £540,000, if my maths are correct. Deputy Provost, as we have heard, uh, this is the equivalent of a reduction of about 10 or 11 primary school teachers or social workers in this council, or as Councillor Wilson said, potentially over half a percent on all council tax bills next year and every year thereafter. In closing, it's very disappointing that the opposition amendment has shirked the opportunity to outline how this budget pressure of half a million pounds will be addressed. Deputy Provost, I support the motion and option one. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I wonder if I might take a moment to remind colleagues before we make a mistake of what we agreed only a few months ago on the 19th of June in Councillor Waters and Sarwar's excellent motion on climate change emergency. It would be unfortunate if we were labelled hypocrites by the young people that Councillor Wilson met on Friday who were complaining about the climate change emergency, and there is, this may be news to colleagues, there is the climate change emergency. We agreed just a while ago. Point of order. This is unacceptable to say this about members of the opposition, please. Well, thank you, Sarah. Right. Uh, just reminding us what we agreed. We agreed that um, it's not too late to turn things around, but to do so would require transformational change. And we also agreed that we should do things by leading by example. It would be my contention if we don't go down option one, which fulfills these things, people outside will think it was simply a, bunch, a pail of green wash. And they'll be able to talk the green talk if we don't talk the green walk. And I think the only way to uh, keep the confidence of the public is to go for option one. I, can I just ask uh, members, when someone's speaking, it would be good manners if we just didn't speak while they were speaking, because sometimes we can't hear what they're saying because some other people are speaking, if you don't mind. Thank you. Are there any further comments? No, in that case, I'll ask Councillor Lyle to sum up. <coughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Um, I don't want to go over the arguments that have been made in this chamber uh, this afternoon. Um, <coughs> I wish to state that um, I don't doubt the sincerity of Councillor Dugan's amendment and um, I am disappointed that she's felt it necessary to bring this amendment, but I would uh, go with the members of this council and say that having heard the arguments uh, put forward uh, by both sides of the, the debate this afternoon, that uh, members will see the correct option to support is model one. Thank you. Now go to the vote. Thank you, Deputy Provost. We're dealing with item 10 on the agenda. Uh, report 19-278, review of school catering services 
report by Executive Director, Education and Children's Services. We have a motion by Councillor Lyle, seconded by Councillor Shires, to agree the recommendations in the report as set out before you. We have an amendment by Councillor Dugan, seconded by Councillor Rebeck, the terms of which have been circulated to you. Can I remind councillors that voting is by roll call, so when I call out your name, can you indicate whether you're voting for the motion or the amendment? Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Bailey. Amendment. Councillor Baird. Motion. Councillor Band. Amendment. Councillor Barnacle. Amendment. Councillor Barrett. Motion. Councillor Braun. Motion. Councillor Brock. Councillor Audrey Coates. Motion. Councillor Harry Coates. Motion. Councillor Donaldson. Amendment. Councillor Dugan. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Duff. Motion. Councillor Forbes. Motion. Councillor Gray. Amendment. Councillor Jarvis. Motion. Councillor Lane. Amendment. Councillor Lyle. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Councillor McCall. Amendment. Councillor McDade. Amendment. Councillor McEwen. Amendment. Provost. <coughs> Motion. Councillor Parrott. Amendment. Councillor Pover. Motion. Councillor Purvis. Amendment. Councillor Rebeck. Amendment. Councillor Reid. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Motion. Councillor Sarwar. Councillor Shires. Motion. Councillor Simpson. Motion. Councillor Stewart. Amendment. Councillor Waters. Amendment. Councillor Williamson. Amendment. Councillor Wilson. Motion. Deputy Provost, I have 16 votes for the motion and 21 votes for the amendment, so the amendment is carried. Thank you. I will now pass you over to Provost for the next paper. Thank you, Deputy Provost Baird. Um, item 11. The item 11 is the Local Child Poverty Action Report. I would like to invite Claire Mailer, Head of Housing, to just introduce wait, the report. We'll just wait till we get two, two, sorry, two councillors to leave to come back. Oh, there's two out. Okay, yep. Okay, is everybody in? Oh no, there's still. Council of to come. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'll go back to the beginning. It's item 11, Local Child Poverty Action Report. I'd like to invite Claire Mailer, Head of Housing, to introduce the report. Thank you, Provost. Members will be aware that the Child Poverty Act 2017 placed a duty on local authorities and health partners to develop and produce local child poverty action reports. This is therefore our first Perth and Kinross child poverty report and I must stress that this really is our starting point. Developing the report has very much been a partnership approach with colleagues from NHS Tayside and a range of services and organisations contributing through workshops, engagement activities and membership on our child poverty working group. The Child Poverty Act sets out very ambitious targets to tackle and eradicate child poverty by 2030 and it highlights that fundamentally poverty is about a lack of income. The three main drivers of child poverty are therefore all income related, income from employment, cost of living and income from benefits. Our action plan as you will see therefore is structured around these three drivers and work 
Work stream leads have been identified for each, with a focus on increasing family income and reducing household costs. We also know that there are certain groups who are at a higher risk of child poverty, so targeting our work to support these priority groups will be key as we go forward. The report summarises some of the very many positive actions that we are progressing and also highlights some high-level actions that we intend to undertake. Our first priority is to undertake a more detailed assessment and analysis of child poverty across the area. We want to do this to gain a better understanding of our local child poverty position and the specific needs of our different communities. So the challenge that we face is significant and it will only be achieved through partnership working and radical change. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Are there any questions on the report? Councillor, I've had a mental block. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. I have a couple of questions, but I'll ask the first one quickly. So on page 24 of the report, it talks about our plan evaluating the impact of activities related to the cost of living, and specifically enhancing the functionality of a rent affordability modelling tool to assess the affordability of private sector rents and predict the rent affordability of all the tenures over five years. Can I get a wee bit more explanation of what this statement actually means? Okay, within the housing service, we have a rent affordability modelling tool that we developed two or three years ago, whereby we assess the affordability of our rents uh, compared to the overall rent levels, both at a local level, uh, at a Tayside level, and also at a national level. Um, and we know, therefore, that our council rents, for example, are the most affordable rents uh, within the Tayside area and certainly within Perth and Kinross. What we want to do, in fact, what we've recently done is enhance that model so that what we can do is test the affordability of private sector rents as well. So we know, uh, I think as man many um, elected members know in rural areas, some of our private rents are particularly expensive. So what we want to do is test that so that therefore when we're undertaking and giving um, housing applicants, housing options advice, we will to do some rent affordability assessment with them about the affordability and suitability of tenancies. Uh, uh, Councillor McEwen, is, are you happy with that? Yes, I was happy with that. Can I ask a second question? Have you a second, have you? Yes, I do. Okay, just one more. A nice complimentary. On page 29 of the report, uh, in order to maximise income for social security and benefits in kind, we as part of a wider evaluation look to see how we can further reduce the cost of the school day and continue to maximise opportunities offered through the Pupil Equity Fund. That's what it says in the report. So the cost of school day is a topic I've raised at Lifelong Learning Committee and I'm grateful to the convener for her acknowledgement and kind words for the Recycle Reuse School Uniform event I ran over the summer in the ward. It would be great for the full council to hear from our officers about how the officers themselves, parent council, school heads and parents are working together to reduce the cost of the school day and the stigma associated with living with poverty. Councillor McEwen, there are um, a number of initiatives that are underway in individual schools and the detail of that uh, we will be bringing to Lifelong Learning Committee um, in due course. In fact, I think there's some information coming in November. But there are a range of different approaches that different schools are taking, which is helping in relation to things like cost of school trips, making sure that uniform is affordable. And in fact, one of the challenges that we presented to our colleagues in the newly recently uh, newly opened Bertha Park High School was to ensure that the uniform there would be affordable, particularly in relation to those people who were in receipt of uh, the clothing grant income. And I'm pleased to say that they were able to meet that challenge, absolutely. The, um, in terms of other areas that are not just about individual schools, we currently also have a small working group made up of colleagues, particularly from our secondary schools, who are looking at minimising the cost of the school day in relation to the curriculum, because we know that sometimes there are additional costs associated with some particularly practical subjects, and what we would like to do is see that at zero across all of our schools. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Provost. Uh, due, due to the stigma of poverty with with uh, uh, ch children children in school and uh, you know with uh, their peers and stuff like that. Um, one of the major challenges which is, is covered in the report is, is priori looking at the priority groups. Um, and on page uh, 2089, page 5 of the report, one of the last, the last elements says uh, families where mothers aged under 25, where there's a 44% chance of children being in relative poverty, which in anybody book is, is very high. Uh, j just, just confirmation, when it says families, that doesn't just mean a single single parents in that, um, but uh, uh, the only obvious thing I can think is that the the, the minimum wage for under twenty fives is lower. But there are, uh, are there are other elements that feed into that that statistic being uh, really unacceptably high, and 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 how do we how do we identify and get these these the children that fit into that category and uh, target them. Okay, uh, the, the uh, priority groups that have been identified that are detailed on page five of the report um, are the ones that were detailed and highlighted through the research that the Scottish Government did when they were pulling together the Child Poverty Act. Uh, and these are the ones that all local authorities and NHS partners have been asked to focus on. Uh, and absolutely, yes, I think in terms of um, families where the mother is aged under 25, there could be an assumption made there that there's a number of factors that would lead to these families being at a higher risk of poverty. That will, would be low income, but also, you know, certainly young mothers. I mean, certainly if we have, you know, teenage mothers that are not in work, um, there's a higher risk, obviously, of poverty. Uh, there's a range of work that we're undertaking, and one of, uh, your question around about how we identify who these households are, that is one of the key main tasks that we want to undertake. And if you see on page 11 of the report, the first thing that we really want to do is undertake a much more detailed qualitative and quantitative assessment of child poverty in the area, and also undertake um, a better assessment to enable officers, frontline workers and services to better identify these priority groups so that we can target our work towards them. So we do that, I mean certainly the assessment that we've undertaken to date to produce the report that uh, is before you today, there's a lot of targeted work that's going on but what we want to do is make sure that we're not missing anybody and that we can really identify all groups and really focus our work towards those. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Councillor McCall. Thank you, Provost. Um, first of all, I actually want to thank officers for the sharing this report with us. I think it's very comprehensive and very, very well written and drafted, so I think that's really good. And I look forward to further reports coming back to full council explaining how you're going to take what you're going to do into a proper detailed programme plan with outcomes and timelines and all of that sort of stuff. My question, I have two very short questions, Provost, if I may. Um, the first one is on page 2103, it's page 19 of the report regarding supply of affordable housing. And I'm wondering, do we currently have a gap analysis between demand and availability for those families with children in poverty who perhaps um, are, particularly in relation to council-owned property, where very often families in poverty need some security of tenure, in particular that they can't always get in other sectors? And my second question is really around funding on page 2110 uh, of, the, of the, our papers and page 26 of the report regarding positive futures. The European Social Fund currently provides match funding to the welfare rights team, but what will replace this uh, post-Brexit? And if there isn't something post-Brexit, what is our contingency? Thank you. Right, certainly in terms of uh, your first question, actually mapping households in poverty to affordable housing, um, or households that are at risk with children within the household of child poverty, I wouldn't say that our approach is as prescriptive of that as the moment, but at the moment, but certainly the plans will be to do more of that, and certainly through the affordability modelling that I talked about, that absolutely will be something that we do. What I would say is that we do do financial assessments on all households that come to us seeking housing options advice and certainly through the homeless route. And we will 
make sure that any offer of housing or any um, signposting towards housing is affordable for them. Absolutely, we will uh, link in with colleagues in welfare rights to ensure that any income is maximised. So we will ensure that any housing offer is the most affordable offer for that housing, uh, that, that household. Um, with regards to your second question about the uh, employment fund, I'm not sure if I'm in a position to give you a detailed answer on that. I do know that in the programme for government, more additional funding has been identified in terms of employability initiatives. I don't know, Barbara. Um, struggling to keep up with all the latest, you know, sort of um, updates in terms of, you know, sort of our position with Europe. However, you know, sort of, I believe that the yeah, UK government still remains committed to I examining ways that they can, you know, sort of replace current European funding. But if that's any different, we'll come back to you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Councillor Sarwar. Thank you, Provost. Um, I have a few questions, and I would appreciate your generosity. I'll try to be brief. Um, on page 12 of the report, the appendix, um, which has already been mentioned, we've given reference to the stigma um, attached to this issue. I just wondered what measures will be used to capture the lived experiences um, that you note know on page 12. And also, I just wondered if you could speak to the role of mini publics and citizens' assemblies in um, our work with our community partnerships and ac action partnerships. Okay, in relation to stigmas and the stigmas associated with poverty, uh, as I said, in terms of the piece of work that we un intend to undertake, um, the qualitative and the quantitative, well, the qualitative aspect of that very much is engaging with households who have got lived experience of poverty, gaining a more detailed understanding of what that experience is like, what the stigmas means, and how we can ensure that we design services very much sort of through their eyes and around their, their viewpoints and their experiences to improve that experience and outcome uh, and their outcomes. So that assessment that we intend to undertake will very much have um, a high level of engagement with uh, people in households that have experienced uh, or are experiencing poverty and also uh, receiving the services that we are delivering. Um, with regards to the second po point of your question, can you remind me what that was? It says on page 12, support our communities and local, local action partnerships play an equal and active role in addressing child poverty. And I just wondered if you could speak to the use of mini publics and citizens' assemblies. I have concerns about action partnerships and how we might actually use them to address um, this issue of poverty um, and inequalities. And I believe that that's not going to happen unless we actually speak to those people that are affected. Okay. Colleagues within our welfare rights team have already been out and spoken to a couple of the local action partnerships and certainly it is our intention, there have been discussions at an EOT level through the Perth and Kinross offer that child poverty and discussions with communities and the local action partnerships in terms of taking forward uh, and addressing poverty and really focusing on what poverty means to different communities will be absolutely key. So certainly in terms of progressing forward with the, the Perth and Kinross offer, child poverty certainly will be a, a key component of that going forward. Yep, a second question, my <coughs> laptop's died. Um, my next question was on page 25. Um, it talks about the contributions is that we're is making. Is this your second question? Or yeah, third? yep. I'll, I'll step up to this. Um, it lists the contributions that we've made. I note that one of the largest contributions that we've that is listed there is the instrumental music service, 139,000. I just wondered if you could say how many in relative absolute or persistent poverty are accessing the IMS. I don't have uh, that detail with me today, Councillor Sarwar. What I can tell you is that we have been able to work with a number of different communities and different organisations, as well as offer individual young people um, greater access. So we have changed the eligibility criteria, for example, to ensure that it um, matches with those that might be entitled to free school meals, for example, and that wasn't the case previously. We know that in instances where there might be existing parental debt and in the past young people have not been able to access IMS, that that has now also been addressed and that we are working to establish a number of um, bans in different areas across Perth and Kinross and, and money that has been put into the, our budget through council motion monies is, using, is being used to support that and some of the criteria 
if you like, around that is, is broadening the reach and ensuring those who are in poverty are able to access that. But in terms of the criteria that you set out there, if you were to provide me with that, we'll see if we can match some data to that for you. Uh, Councillor Farrett. Provost, thank you. Can I say that I greatly welcome this report, not for the issues it highlights, but for the solutions it presupposes. I um, am drawn with concern to the numbers or the percentages in the child poverty priority groups, but equally I'm delighted to see the detailed work that is um, contained within the What We Will Do section on page 11. But my question would be, what are the time... Okay, absolutely. I mean, I think the point in terms of the higher level uh, strategic action there on, on page 11 um, is absolutely key in terms of informing uh, some of our future, future activity and improvements. I would hope that we will be able to undertake this piece of work over the next few months and into next year then. Um, I would say revise the action plan because I must stress that, as members will see within the report, there are a large number of actions that are already progressing. They're doing a significant amount of good work already. That is continuing. Um, already since the report was submitted to the Scottish Government in June, there have been a number of key actions that have continued to progress. So we've got some other good work ongoing. The Child Poverty Group is meeting on a regular basis. But once this kind of more detailed assessment of child poverty in the area is undertaken, which I hope will take place over the next few months, then that will obviously set the direction. The action plans, the Scottish Government are absolutely clear that the action plans should cover almost a five-year period, and we review them on an annual basis going forward based on progress. Thank you. Um, now, I'm going to take Councillor Fulmer now, and I will have another... Thank you. Okay, right. Thank, thank you. It was just to add what, to what Claire has already said. In terms of the action to explore the link between uh, children who are involved in statutory intervention and poverty. We have uh, had meetings with the independent care review who are also considering that. So in terms of timescales, they're looking to produce something nationally by the end of this year, beginning of next year. So we're going to be working with them on that. So uh, that's that's pretty imminent. If, 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 sorry. If, if I may, that points to... Um, the answer I was looking for, and I, I was looking for whether that time frame um, might allow for the consideration of certain actions within the next budgetary process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, as I said, uh, I've got Councillor Power, and I'm going to take four more. I've got Williamson, Rebick, Donaldson, and Wilson, and then I think we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. It's a very important subject, this, and I'm giving everybody an opportunity, but I think we've I'm sure you'll agree with me that we have to move on. Thank you very, that's great. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, I'd just like to obviously um, thank Council for providing what is a very comprehensive report, and it's, it's a, it, you know, I'm very grateful for that. My question was, I'd just like to clarify if the Council continues to provide fan financial support to kinship carers eh, in the form of allowances. Yes, I can confirm that kinship carers continue to receive allowances for the children on a par with those that uh, for allowances for foster carers. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm just aware that other councils that that's not the case, so I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williamson. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak, Provost. I believe on page nine, almost a quarter of people working in Perth and Kinross are paid less than the Scottish Government advised higher minimum wage, or living wage, should I say. Uh, what are we currently doing uh, today to reduce this number, and what are our plans going forward to ensure workers of Perth and Kinross get a fair pay? OK, 
Okay, certainly this is some of the work that we're doing with um, support through our colleagues in the employability team and also within economic development. So there's a good number, a, a lot of engagement with employers within the areas and we obviously need to do uh, more in that respect. Um, again, through the Power Thinking Law Survey. Chief Executive would like to say something on that. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Only last week I was presenting on the Perth and Kinross offer to the Perth Ambassador, and one of the key things that I outlined in terms of our offer, what we will ask of them is for employers to pay the living wage as part of the Perth and Kinross offer. Okay. Right. Councillor Rebeck. Thank you, Provis. How much poorer are our kids and indeed their parents as a result of the rollout of universal credit? Was that a question? Yes. I'm happy to accept there was a tad rhetoric about that, so I'm not really requiring an answer. Okay. <laughs> Only one question. Um, like others, I want to welcome this report and thank people for the effort they put in, also for the briefing session we had for councils in, in May, and also for the training session held by the Welfare Rights Team in Crete, I think that was in July, uh, and that was very helpful. And that's what I want to turn to, because the one thing that really stood out for me is on page 9, there's a table there, and it's not just the fact that Strathern as the highest level of child poverty in Perth and Kinross outwith uh, Perth City, but it's the trend which went from 13% to 17% to 20%, and that really alarms one. Can I just ask where you s uh, if it believe that trend may be going? I know there's been some interventions, and that's welcome. Uh, are they, those interventions going to be sustained? I think there's maybe lessons to be learned more generally. So it's not just a statistical thing, but uh, aberration. It's quite a marked increase in four years from 13% to 20%. Thanks. Yes, as you can see, I mean, I think s certainly Strathairn does stand out. And I think for some of the, the discussions that we had at the working group, and I think some of the subsequent discussions that you've had with the welfare rights team, there has been some very focused work that has been undertaken within that area. What I would also stress is that although what we, what we cannot do is just focus on localities, whilst we might have some areas which would appear to have relatively low uh, levels of child poverty. We may have one or two individual households within these areas that are living in acute poverty. So again, going back to the, the, the fundamental need for us to really do that more drilled down and that more detailed analysis of child poverty to really gain that um, rich, detailed understanding at a locality level of what the key drivers and causes are for child poverty to enable us to tar target our work, that will be absolutely key. Quick supplementary. Uh, I hear what you say and I understand, but the interventions you've made in, is particularly in the south side of Crete, they've had an impact already, you believe? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Provost. One liner question. I don't know if you know the answer, but you can send it on a postcard if you wish. What one thing could we do as individual councillors in the next three to six months to help you? <laughs> Councillor Wilson, whilst I appreciate the sentiment of the, the question, my view would be that the silver bullet shop is empty and we shouldn't keep going there to look for just one particular approach, and I absolutely understand what you're saying, but to tackle some, uh, a, a problem that has been so stubbornly resistant to change over a significant number of years, the, the real answer is there's no elegant one solution. It will be the, the culmination of a range of different contributions from different people um, in a concerted way that will actually make the biggest difference ultimately. Thank you, Provost, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lyle, can I ask you to move the report? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Provost. And just in, in response to Councillor Wilson, the challenge, I think, for the administration and, and for all councillors in this room is to drive forward the economy, and that will inevitably help child poverty. This paper presents our first Perthink and Ross local child poverty action report, which this council is asked to endorse. Members will be aware that the Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017 set out ambitious tackle targets to tackle and eradicate child poverty. It also placed a duty on local authorities and health partners to develop and produce local child poverty action reports. The report was approved by the Community Planning Partnership Board and the Children and Young People and Families Partnership prior to submission to the Scottish Government at the end of June. This is our first report and it has been developed with colleagues from NHS Tayside and a range of other partners and stakeholders. The importance of this area of work is highlighted by the stark fact that here in Perth and Kinross, around one in five of our children, which is around 4,000, are living in poverty. And that child poverty is an issue that is affecting, that affects all our communities. We recognise that we face specific challenges that negatively impact on household income, including lower wage jobs, availability of affordable housing, and availability of the cost and cost of transport. The report summarises some of the many positive actions that all our partners are already progressing to mitigate the impacts of child poverty. It also sets out a number of high level actions that we intend to progress to further improve our approach in tackling child poverty here in Perth and Kinross. The negative impacts of child poverty on children are clear and properly tackling child poverty to make the changes we need will require action, ownership and commitment from all stakeholders. The Child Poverty Action Report sits within the strategic context of Fairer Futures and the Community Plan and further progress will be reported to the Community Planning Partnership and the Council in due course. Happy to move this report. Thank you, Councillor Lyle. Uh, Councillor Braun, second it. Thank you, Provost. And firstly, may I add my thanks to officers for this comprehensive report. The report is the first to be produced by Perth and Kinross with a range of partners and is the starting point for tackling the causes of child poverty. It cannot be underestimated given that there are, as we've heard, some 4,000 children in poverty within Perth and Kinross. And this is spread over all wards and is an issue for all communities and for all of us. As you will read, the report outlines the target set for 2030 and it identifies the priority groups such as lone parent families, families with a disabled adult or child and minority ethnic families. And it puts forward, puts forward proposals of what we can do to combat the drivers of child poverty, improving household income by means of employment with fair pay or advice on the correct social service benefits available and reducing household costs. Provost. Poverty is unfair, it affects families, communities, and importantly, children, and lessens their ability to live out their hopes and dreams. It can leave them significantly disadvantaged by lack of education and skills, which perpetuates the cycle, and we must do everything we can to break that cycle. This report shows the work that has been done, is being done, and is to be done. Reducing child poverty and working towards eradicating it, if we can, should be something that concerns us all and unites us in a common goal. And if nothing else could unite us, this should be the one thing that does. Every child, no matter how poor, should have the chance to reach for their dreams. I'm happy to support the paper. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Are there any comments on the report? Councillor McCall. Thank you, Provost. Um, my comments are quite general to uh, the, the response that uh, Claire Miller gave me in terms of my question about affordable housing, uh, my sense on that is that very often we react to circumstances that present themselves to us. So I would hope that as we develop the action plan to take this report, this action plan forward, that we start looking more proactively and saying what are the underlying drivers, as Councillor Braun has said, so that we can, you know, try and stop the perpetual cycle of child poverty. So I would urge uh, officers to at least think about that. The other thing is about cross cross project working, if you want. I notice that in, in the report we talk about the, um, the Young Scott card for public transport. 
and they talk about alleviating fuel poverty, but they also have a wider discussion ongoing about a tackling climate change and, and the climate emergency. So I would like to think that when we do see the more detailed working uh, program of, of work to deliver this report, that we demonstrate cross working so that where there's common elements, we work across functions as opposed to just in a linear way. But otherwise, the report's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McEwen. Thank, thank you, Provost. First, I'd like to say I do completely agree with Councillor Braun, and I, I do think this is something that we can work on and have agreement with. Provost, I think this is one of the most important reports to come before this Council. I want to thank all those officers involved in creating the report for their excellent work. I wish all the best to our officers and partners as they take this work forward. I find it very sad that in Perth and Kim Ross, a relatively affluent area of Scotland, we have one in five children in poverty, where 30% of households have fuel poverty, and one in nine working households need benefits to raise their incomes, and the use of food banks is on the rise. The statement in the report that hit, hit home to me most was that poverty is unfair, it impacts on children, families and communities, and feeds the conditions which lead to deprivation and disadvantage. This increases a person's vulnerability to circumstances, which reduces their ability to make the best of the life chances available. Poverty is not inevitable, but being born and raised in poverty can have a big impact on a child's future, potential effects on their perspectives on life, chances of gaining qualifications, building positive relationships, and remaining in good health or gaining employment in later life. Provost, I was brought up on a council estate by loving parents who ensured and insisted that I did well at school. They sacrificed everything for myself, my brother and my sister so that we would do well. Uh, not all the people I grew up with had those advantages. Some of the reasons they didn't have these advantages are detailed in this report. Provost, I feel fortunate I could go to university free of charge, to study pharmacy, to work in the NHS, and a stable, reliable job that pays very well. But the joy and reward I get from my professional career is helping people and working in a multidisciplinary team to make patients' lives better and hope that my role as a counsellor in the path of this paper plays some way to reducing child poverty and the needed benefits, reversing fuel poverty and removes the need for food banks. In-work benefits are a government subsidy for low pay and our efforts to ensure greater uptake of the higher living wage is key to this report. Funding for the Welfare Rights Team and Citizens Advice Bureau is something, as a councillor, I've been proud to support in all the budgets and all the different amendments of budgets I've had this support in, because they do invaluable work on behalf of this council. Provost, there are many other different aspects of this report I could go on and champion, but I will finish on my Recycle Reuse School Uniform event during the summer, which was universally received in a positive light, and I've already had further discussions with officers on how to take this forward, and that prompted my earlier question. But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Parent Councils of Glasgow High School, Rattray Primary School, Meanhill Primary, St Stephen's Primary and Cooper Agnes Primary <coughs> School, the library staff in Blair and the staff of the Blair and Rattray Development Trust Office who provided drop-off points, advertising and access to the various school uh, lost property rooms and made the event possible. On promise I'd like to thank you as well. At the end of a six hour meeting, you're still giving us the opportunity to comment on something that is very important, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKeon. Uh, Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Provost. As has been said numerous times this afternoon, this is the one paper which should unite us all, and I'm sorry to say that Councillor Rebeck's comments about benefits, I, I think, went against that. I would like to remind Councillor Rebeck that the Scottish Government were indeed offered the uh, opportunity to take on some more benefits but chose to send them back again. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Wilson talked about what is the one silver bullet, or sorry, the one thing we can do. Sheena's box of silver bullets is empty, we understand. But the, I think the one thing we can do is education. And we've just voted to strip the best part of £500,000 out of our education budget. I don't think that's going to help poverty one bit. Um, thank you, uh, Provost. I want to commend the uh, authors of the Child Poverty Action Plan. As we've heard previously from other speakers, it is a comprehensive um, action plan that identifies the general, generational nature of poverty with poor children becoming poor parents and the severely 
uh, limiting impact of growing up in poverty on people's uh, future life chances and, and well-being. Uh, and I agree with Councillor McCall that breaking that cycle uh, of poverty is the challenge that we, we, all, we all face in this chamber. Um, I welcome the additional assessment work which will identify and uh, target where uh, uh, child poverty exists uh, in, in, in our communities uh, and Councillor Braun has, has uh, outlined um, the, the, the main uh, 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 family circumstances uh, where that uh, poverty uh, exists. We also know uh, the big impact and in interventions um, that will uh, make a difference uh, to help those families. Um, welfare rights activity that's mentioned in the, in, in the report, income maximisation, uh, welfare rights and, and benefits advice, things like the uh, Tenants Resilience Fund uh, to, to, to help um, uh, tenants of ours who, who, who get into difficulties uh, because of universal credit. Um, that has been set up with the approval of our tenants uh, to help out their, their neighbours. Again, things like the investment that we make uh, in the Citizens Advice Bureau that uh, Tom McEwen uh, mentioned, but also we have a situation where we've got um, non-recurring recurring funding for the, for the food bank, and I think longer term we need to look at putting that on a permanent uh, 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 budget footing. Um, there's clearly a, a, a lot that um, uh, communities can do to support their, their, their neighbours uh, and our role is to uh, encourage and support that uh, through things like holiday hunger clubs but also through things like uh, uh, the, our, our local action partnerships. The report recognises the need for greater collaboration to make more effective connections with people experiencing poverty and tackling poverty. Uh, child poverty needs to be absolutely central uh, to the conversations that we have with communities uh, through the Perth of Kinross offer. And that was a point I made to Aileen Campbell, Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government, uh, when she uh, visited Perth last month. Uh, very happy to endorse the report from us. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Sarwar. Thank you, Provost. Whilst there are many positives in this report, I must say that I found it very hard reading to know that as many as 4,000 of our children in Perth and Kinross are living, learning and growing in poverty is very distressing. If ever we needed a call to arms for our work in the public sector and as politicians, this report is surely that. I would add, though, that yet again such a significant report has come at the end of a busy agenda and I would ask that future papers on this matter come either higher up or are come first to the Lifelong Learning Committee. The recent increases in need for emergency grants and food bank vouchers are a shocking indictment of modern Britain. Two thirds of those children living in poverty have at least one parent in work. For my parents, this was enough to raise four children who never wanted for anything. Sadly, that is all too often not the case today. The Scottish Government has set ambitious targets as set out in the report, and I take comfort from the serious consideration and reflective nature of the po points of action laid out. However, a serious strength of vision and commitment will be needed to reach these goals. I have no doubt that our officers will do all they can, and I'm grateful for the comments made on both sides of the chambers today, and I would urge us all to keep this matter in our hearts and at the forefront of our minds in our budget discussions and the centre of our collective Perth and Kinross offer. Thank you, Provost. Councillor Sauer, and the last one is Councillor Rebeck. Thank you, Provost.
Thank you, Councillor Rebick. <coughs> I think the, the next item on the agenda is to get new mics. Uh, do, do we agree? <laughs> yes. Uh, item 12, the proposed timetable of meetings. Scott Hendry has got something to say on this. Councillors, can I just draw your attention since the issuing of the timetable? Um, there's a couple of errors. Um, with regards to the meetings of the employees JCC, there's a double entry in September and, Oc and October, so the, the date should just be the 24th of September, not the 1st of October. Um, uh, the, with regards to the October recess, the, the shading um, should have been entered on the, the weeks there, and it should be that the October recess would be the 5th until the 16th of October. Um, another further point through the Leader of the Council, it's been suggested that the afternoon committee meetings on a Wednesday would begin at 1.30 p.m., rather than 1 p.m. So that's just something for Council to consider. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, given these corrections, do we agree the report? We're not at the timetable, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's uh, well over six hours now, but you've done very well. And a big thank you to uh, our new uh, Deputy Provost, who got thrown in the deep end today, and also to Willie, just to wish him very best. Uh, thank you again. And thank you for the officers. Thank you. <laughs>